We'll now take the sedum for the planning committee by roll call. The following members are present. Councillors Alec Allison, John Anderson, John Bradley, Arch Buchanan, Jackie Burns, Margaret Cowie, Peter Craig, Maureen Devlin. Councillor Mary Donnelly, are you present? Yes, Stuart, I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Dorman is present. Councillor Fiona Dryborough. Councillors Lindsay Hamilton, Ian Harrow, Mark Holsham are all present. I have apologies from Councillor Anne LeBlonde and Councillor Kenny McCreary is attending as a substitute. I have apologies from Councillor Martin Lennon and Councillor Jerry Convery is attending as a substitute. Councillors Joe Lowe and Ian McCallan are present. I have apologies from Councillor David McLaughlin and Councillor Walter Brogan is attending as a substitute. Councillor Lynn Nalen. Present. Thank you. Councillor Carol Nugent. Hi, Stuart. Thank you. Councillor John Ross. Councillor Graham Scott is present. Councillor David Shearer. Here. Thank you. Councillor Bert Thompson. Uh, here. Thank you. And Councillor Jim Mortot is also present. Yeah, I've also noted the officers who are present and I will now pass you back to the chair for today's business. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Do we have any declarations of interest? Lindsay? Chair, I need to declare an interest on item nine. A family member has made an observation. Okay, Lindsay, thank you. Agenda item three, up, sorry, item two, minutes of previous meeting. Submitted for approval is the correct record. That's from pages five to 12. Can we agree the minutes of previous meeting? Agreed, Agreed. Okay, Agreed. Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item three, application P21-02-10, and that's in pages 13 to 24, and the last Tina to take us for the item. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is a detailed planning application for the erection of a dwelling house um, at uh, Kittle side of Kermunnock Road in East Cobride. Um, the application would... Tina, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, sorry about lost you there. Oh, okay. Um, that better? Are you okay just now? Yeah, I can hear you now, yeah. Okay, I'll just adjust the, the volume. Um, okay, I'll start again. Um, it's a detailed planning application for the erection of a dwelling house um, at Kittock Side and access off Kermunnock Road in East Cobride. The application would normally have been dealt with under delegated powers. Um, however, local member Councillor McAdams had requested that it be determined at a planning committee. The application site, as you can see on page 24 of the papers, relates to an area of land to the east of Inver Cottage um, off uh, Kermunnock Road. The site is largely located within an area designated as Greenbelt in the adopted South Lanarkshire Local Plan, uh, Development Plan 2, but also includes a small strip of land within the settlement boundary. This is an ex the strip that's included within the settlement boundary is uh, an access to Inver Cottage. It's a secondary access to Inver Cottage at the moment. Um, if this was approved, then it's proposed that this would form the access to the new plot. Um, and that's why, because it's development in the ground, that's why it's within the, the, the village settlement. The application seeks, uh, sorry, the applicant seeks detailed consent for the, a, a house on the site. It would be an L-shaped house, one and a half storey, um, and positioned centrally within the site. The applicant has also submitted a design statement as well as a further planning statement in support of the proposal. The planning statement refers to policies of the, the previous local plan, which are now no longer relevant, um, as well as policies that are in the development plan too, which, which I'll come on to. 
under the current policy, the policies, the writer is arguing that the site can be justified as a gap site and it would consolidate the existing group. Um, but as I say, I'll, I'll come on to that in terms of our response. Turning to planning policy, as set out in, in uh, section three, um, we have to assess it against the existing policies. It's largely the site is within the green belt, um, and policy for green belt and rural area is particularly applicable, um, along with the other development management policies that are listed there. Just as uh, by way of background, the applicant submitted the same proposal in 2020 under planning application P200172. Um, and at that time, um, we also advised that it was in the green belt and would be unable to support the application as there was no policy justification. It was contrary to the plan um, at that time um, and the application was withdrawn at that time. In terms of consultations, there are no adverse uh, comments from consultees. Um, however, in terms of representations, we have received 13 letters of objection and one letter of comment. And these points are all set out in section uh, five of the report. The representations lar largely focus on the Greenbelt location of the plot and the fact that it's contrary to the, to the plan and local, um, also local amenity issues if the plot was to be developed, um, all of which we would uh, broadly concur. Following assessment of the proposal, it's considered that the site does not qualify as a gap site and would not consolidate the existing group there. Um, secondary to the green belt issue, um, the site also includes hedgerows and trees, um, particularly along the frontage of the site. Um, but as I say, that's that they're more detailed matters if the principle was um, acceptable. Turning to our assessment and conclusion, um, in terms of Greenbelt Policy 4, the proposed dwelling is not required. Um, there's no justification for it in terms of agriculture, forestry or recreation, and no justification has been provided to, de to demonstrate that there is a specific locational need or established need for the proposed dwelling. The site contains no dilapidated or intrusive buildings and there's no visible ground-based infrastructure um, there on the site and therefore this proposal does not involve the redevelopment of previously developed uh, land containing buildings, um, again contrary to policy. The application site is not considered to be bounded, bound on two sides by habitable properties. It is bound on one side um, by the existing residential property known as Inver Cottage. However, to the east, the site is open grazing uh, land. And that for us is really why it's, it's contrary to policy, because any development here would just extend uh, the settlement. It's approximately 240 metres along the southern side of Kermunnock Road um, until you reach the next uh, property, which is a farm, um, East, East Kittock Side Farm. It's not considered as an identifiable gap site um, and therefore it's development contrary to development plan, contrary to our policy um, and as such it would fail the policy, um, policy four, um, but also policies GBRA 8 and GBRA 9. Um, therefore, Chair, we're recommending refusal of the application. Thank you, Tina. Jim, you've got a question? Uh, not so much a question, just to agree with the, the refusal. You know, the green belt is a very sensitive issue, and one of the, the, the reasons for having green belt policy is to stop the the merging of you know uh, towns and villages or whatever. And some bits of the green belt are more sensitive than others. And I think between East Kilbride and Busby. Uh, Kermunnock, you know, that's a very sensitive area. It's an area where encroachments have been made over the years in various places. And I think that's a really essential to keep the green belt between East Kilbride and the surrounding settlements. And, that, you know, from that point of view, I think that it's crucial that developments like this shouldn't take place. Thank you, Jim. Graham, you want to come in? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. I mean, I take, uh, I take Councillor Warhol's broader point about the green belt, but I want to make a slightly narrower point uh, in relation to, to this application. And I generally feel that Mr. and Mrs. Brennan, the applicants, must be the unluckiest applicants in front of this committee for a long while. 
cottages inside the village envelope. The northern, the, I think, the northern part of their land uh, is inside the, the the settlement boundary. Yet Tina's right in her interpretation that the where they want to put a house. I think we've lost Graham's connection. Yeah, you still wasn't it? Lost the sound. Hello. Yeah, Welcome I, back. I went black for a second there. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, can you hear yes. me, Graham? Thanks. It's a broader point. I don't know. What, I don't. I don't know what you heard and, and didn't hear, but it's a broader point in terms of settlement boundaries and the fact that. In fact, it was an illustrious predecessor of, of, of Pauline as um, head of planning, Ian Urquhart, it used the, the, the wonderfully descriptive phrase to me about some of the settlement boundaries around the small villages uh, and hamlets as shark's teeth boundaries. And I think there should be, and this is the point I want to make in terms of the, the arbitrary nature of some of these settlement boundaries end up in the position that Mr and Mrs Brennan is in, that their cottage and part of their land is inside the settlement boundary and the land that they own is split and outside the settlement boundary as well. The point that I want to expand on is that I know local plans usually decide the, the settlement boundaries and we have the arbitrary nature of some of them. Would there be a, a chance, and if Pauline can come in, that we either, uh, prior to the local plan, that we look at and do a review of settlement boundaries around our villages and hamlets? Because they will, you will find inconsistencies, like the inconsistency that poor Mr and Mrs Brennan have had to, to endure here, that um, part of their, their cottage and part of their land is inside, had they wanted to do, build this house in the land that was inside the village envelope, there wouldn't be a problem. Because it's part of land he owned outside the boundary, uh, obviously Tina and has made the, the right call in terms of the law as it stands. But if Pauline can come in on the broader point about settlement boundaries, because I do think that Mr and Mrs Brennan are desperately unlucky here, that land they own has been split between inside and outside of an arbitrary settlement boundary. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Graham. Polly, would you like to come in? Thank, thanks, Chair. Um, I'm probably going to ask Tony Finn to come in with his plan and policy hat on, but I think the kind of easy settlement is uh, easy answer is you've got to draw the boundary line somewhere. <laughs> And from that point of view, you know, you are either in or out, but we, we do feel that this is clearly in the green belt. Um, but as regards to sort of the review of settlement boundaries through the development plan, I don't know if Tony has any comments, please, Tony. I do, yeah, and thanks to you, Chair. Um, just in general terms, um, we're, we're currently um, undergoing um, a consultation by the government on um regulations and guidance on the preparation of local development plans. The regime, the process is, is, has changed as a result of the 2019 Act, but we expect to start pre preparation of the next LDP sometime later this year on, on the back of back of this consultation. Um, part of the work we want to do when we start pre preparing the new local plan, new, new local development plan, is to carry out what's called a green belt review. Um, now that involves looking at every settlement within the green belt and just checking whether as as council scott has alluded to whether the, the boundaries are, are correct or not and we take into account built form landscape character issues like that the last time that was done i'm told was back in the late 90s so it certainly needs uh, an update and, and a fresh review so we, we, we will do that as part of the ldb process we can't change boundaries unilaterally uh, with the ldb process so we'd have to go um, hand in hand with that. Uh, but as I say, we have committed to, to do that work um, as, as we start on that process. Hope, hope, that, hope that helps. Thank you, Tony. Graham, did you want to come back in? Fine, thank you. I think the point's been made, as I say, I accept what the, the Tina, the, the interpretation of planning law in relation to the Green Bill is. But again, I, I reiterate the point in terms of Mr and Mrs Brennan 
that one person can own land that is inside and outside of a settlement boundary and it's contiguous land that they own. Thank you. Thank you. Alec? Yeah, Chair, it's just a point of procedure. I know that Tina was saying that this should have been dealt with by delegated powers to officers, but the local member had asked for it to come to committee. Sorry, just my ignorance. Is that something that is a, given as a right, or does there need to be justification for um, asking for something to come to committee? I'll invite Pauline to come back to answer that. Thank you, Pauline. Thanks, Chair. Councillor Allison, um, in our decision making guide, members do have the right, and, and actually, we, we never refuse it. It's a relatively rare occurrence, and we do give um, you know the responsibility to the local member. So, um, we always allow it. And you may recall when we were considering reviewing the decision making guide at the start of this administration, it was something that members felt very, very strongly about and wanted to retain. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. I don't see any other hands up, so I'll move the recommendation. I'll second it, Chair. Thank you. Do you the report? Thank you. Agreed. Agreed. Agenda item four, that's application <coughs> P211525, and pages 25 to 42, and I'll ask Tony to take us through the item. Thank you, Tony. Yes, thank you, Chair. So this is the detailed application for the construction and operation of a battery storage system on land at Dan Gray Road in Rutherglen. It was reported to the plan committee in December. Now, after a vote, the committee agreed to defer a decision on the application to allow further information to be gathered. And the report before members today has been updated to incorporate those issues that were raised by them. And so before going on to update members about those matters, just to remind you that um, the application site is located to the east of Tamarack Road and south of Danny Bray Road in Rutherglen. The River Clyde is to the north of the site, with the Dalmanic to Rutherglen railway line some 450 metres to the west. The site itself sits wholly within the former Sandmex industrial complex, which is now being demolished and the, the site is currently vacant. Approximately 150 metres southeast of the application site is the Scottish Power Dalmanic grid supply point. The proposals involve the construction and operation of a battery storage system, um, so stored electricity will comprise up to 24 battery storage containers, a Siri infrastructure, a substation, an access road, and security lighting and CT, CCTV. So just um, in terms of uh, the, the issues that were raised by members last time, firstly, concern was highlighted about the impact of the proposals um, on the, the units occupied by the travelling show people, um, that that not being taken into account. So in response to that, the report's been updated to highlight that the entrance to their site is 75 metres from the nearest part of the application site. Um, they weren't required to be served with neighbour notification because of that distance. Um, however, the application was advertised in the local newspaper. In addition, the applicant was required to carry out statutory pre-application consultation because um, the proposals involve a major development. As part of that process, the applicant notified some 660 local properties, including the show people, and also the local members for the area, um, with an invitation to an online public consultation, and also included contact details of where further information could be sought. The pre-application consultation submitted with the application um, that we have before us says that only one household from the area responded to that publicity. Um, in terms of the noise, um, the, the, the scope of the noise impact assessment submitted with the application was agreed in advance with environmental uh, services colleagues and it was carried out uh, in accordance with the, the appropriate British standards. And in particular, the show people accommodation at Caithness Park was included as a potential sensitive receptor. Environmental service officers also then carried out their own background noise measurements to verify the noise impact assessment that had been submitted. So as a result of that, they agree with the conclusions of the assessment that there will be no detrimental impact on any resident, residential property and including the show people. They therefore have no objections to the proposal, subject to conditions requiring noise limits being placed on the proposals to protect the media of the area, as well as in uh, relation to uh, contaminated land and controlling noise and construction times. In terms of public safety, um, and members particularly raised the issue of potential fire risk. Um, firstly, 
Um, the building regulations don't define this type of building as, as one of a place of special fire risk. And therefore, any subsequent building warrant for proposals would not require any special fire safety measures uh, to, be, um, to be provided. In addition, we've had informal discussion with the area fire officer, um, and that's revealed that if built, the premises would be relevant premises under the Fire Scotland Act, um, and the premises would be subject to um, an audit um, should the need arise, i.e. If, if a fire risk is, is perceived. Uh, well, they, they believe it's unlikely to be a high risk to people as there would be limited number of occupants in the building. Um, an audit will only be carried out as a result of a fire or if notified there was a risk. Um, the applicant has also confirmed the proposals would include an integrated fire prevention and suppression system uh, being built into the design. This system would comprise um, an LE1 system, so that if any battery cell was failing um, via gas detectors in each battery, and that would trigger um, an automatic power disconnection and send an alarm to the monitoring station. If heat was detected, there would also be a discharge of inert gas to displace all oxygen in the battery area to stop any fire developing. And finally, there would be an external access to the um, internal sprinkler system that could be supported by the fire service if a fire broke out. So in view with this, we're satisfied there'd be no risks to public safety, uh, and I say especially in terms of um, fire risk. In terms of the effect on the wider generation of the area, um, it's accepted the proposal won't generate significant job opportunities within the immediate area. However, the proposals do relate to national grid stability, and that's important in the transition from fuel, fossil fuel energy generation to renewables. The importance of grid stability is significant um, in the increase in renewable energy production. And facilities of this nature will be increasingly required as part of this so why not create indirect um, direct employment opportunities? It's considered the proposals fit within the renewable energy supply chain, which will create, in more general terms, a greener greener employment opportunities in the wider economy as the transition to renewables moves forward. The development is a standalone proposal um, that would be compatible with within a commercial area, and it doesn't sterilise access into the wider site. Um, if members remember that there's a permission in principle for a, um, a leisure and hot food and restaurant um, consent on that site. The application site itself re represents only 10% of the overall site area and it's considered that the development potential of this remaining amount of land is not hindered by the current proposals. Um, it's also noted that the overall site has lain vacant for five years since the regional permission in principle was granted and there's been no developer interest in, in coming forward. So the location of the site it significantly is within 100 meet, 150 metres of the existing grid supply point, which will minimise any energy transmission infrastructure required. So overall, uh, Chair, we're, 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 we're satisfied that we've addressed the, the concerns that were raised by members last time, and we're satisfied that proposals comply with local development plan policy as well, so recommending approval. Thank you, Tony. Graham? Thank you, Chair. Uh, obviously, we will all recall last month when obviously we, with Councillor Lennon uh, moved the uh, opposition to this uh, refusal and I obviously seconded it. Unfortunately, uh, Councillor Lennon uh, can't be here today because, and this is a good news story, that uh, he's on paternity leave, that uh, Martin and Kate um, have a young son, so... I say, I hope we can pass on the good wishes of everyone at the planning committee to Martin and Kate and their, their, their lovely new son. So it's been left to me to do some of the stuff that I've spoken with Martin uh, on a carry-on from, from last month. Um, I take the point about the, the consultation with the, the show people, but again, I think I think that some people would have liked to have seen a, a more a more visible show of consultation with the show people who are very important. I know they're 75 metres away, but I think they have to be given due consideration here. And but I take the uh, Tony's point. The other one is uh, on relation to the Fire Scotland Act. And yes, the, the these sort of new battery plants, energy storage systems will be under fall under the Fire Scotland Act. 
But there's always a danger with new technologies, and I'll include batteries, hydrogen, the carbon capture technologies, that legislation for safety can lag behind the new technologies. That's why, in many ways, I suppose I'm calling out the Scottish Government and the MSPs at Holyrood, that they have got to make sure that things like the Fire Scotland Act, that all the fire legislation are up to date with the new industrial processes that are coming on stream, like storage, battery storage of electricity, carbon capture, hydrogen. There's got to be, uh, there, there can't be a time lag between, between the two. And the broader point and why, uh, see, I give notice that I'll, I'll, I'll move refusal again on the grounds of, and just make sure, on the loss of amenity to local residents and impact on economic development. Was And I see I had a good chat with, with Councillor Lennon, and, and if he was here today, he would have said the, exactly what I would be saying, is that five years ago, uh, when, he, when he got elected in 2017, obviously he spoke with planning officers at that time about the regeneration of that area, and we've seen it with Cunningham Loop. It's a fabulous new park facility now. It really is. It's, it's top of the range in terms of old land, basically reclaimed land from industrial processes back into a lovely park now. People have been enticed to, to buy properties in that area. New communities are developing in that area. And I know that, that Council Lennon's have got excellent relationship with some of the community groups and the people who are now living in that area. By the way, we're talking about houses 150 metres away. And on top of all this, basically bringing a, an old derelict industrial area back from the grave, so to speak. There's a battery plant going to be put right next door to them. I accept that it's industrial zone land, but it's incongruous in terms of the work. And by the way, I'm praising the council for the amazing work they've done down there, that people are getting enticed to go back to that land. But to, to spoil it all, there's going to be a battery storage plant right next to them. So, as I say, I, I will certainly move the refusal again on the grounds of loss of amenity to local residents and impact on economic development. Thank you so much. Thank you, Graham. And can you pass on our best wishes to Councillor Lennon from all the committee? Councillor Thompson? Thanks, Chair. I'd like to second uh, Councillor Graham Scott there. Uh, it's been read clearly stated that Hello, can you see me? Hello? Yes. Hello, you got us now. Uh, it's been clearly stated that there's no going to be any great job opportunities here. There's one thing. Erring on the side of caution with this new technology is more important. The, the fear is something is actually just as bad as an actual event, and we don't want to see anything like that happening, obviously, no matter how much safety is put in place. And the third thing I'd like to say is, there's no compulsion to put this site here. It could, it could be put in a lot of places. Why here? We could put maybe more development like houses, etc. So, I'm certainly for uh, against that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Bert. Peter? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, yeah, congratulations to Martin and his partner. Uh, that's, that is very good news. Uh, but as far as this planning application goes, uh, you know, you, uh, this fear of the future uh, really doesn't help. Uh, I've been in the job long enough to hear all the fears about... Uh, wireless internet connections, G1 was going to fry your brain, G2 was going to do even worse, G3 was going to destroy children, G4, G5, the same all the way, all the way along. So uh, I'm, I'm very much in favour uh, of the modernisation in the en energy process. This is part of that. We're going to need that in the future. So I don't have any, uh, and I'll also say thanks very much to the officers we have gone back and addressed some of the concerns that, uh, in fact, I think they've addressed all the concerns that, that councillors had about this application. So thanks very much to them. Uh, but I really don't see there's any need to object to the progress that this uh, this indicates. So uh, I'll certainly be voting uh, to uh, adopt the, uh, the amendment. Uh, sorry, adopt the, uh, the programme as is in the paper. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Tony, could I ask Tony a question, please? 
Tony, you, you said the environmental services had uh, done a, a test for noise nuisance. What was it based on, considering the plants know there? In the proximity. I mean, uh, it's an afterthought that we actually uh, went and spoke to the, the show people. That should have been done from the very beginning, so it wasn't it? It was, it was, a, was more than a concern. These people were just excluded for the whole process. But I'm more interested in how environmental health can agree that there won't be any noise pollution. And the site's not there. Yeah, to, to you, Chair. Yeah, Councillor Convery, um, the, the noise impact assessment was carried out in... Um, in terms of the, the relevant British standards that, that exist at the moment, so it was done in accordance with with um, established guidelines. Um, it, what what happens when we come to a situation where we're trying to guess what the impact might be um, on on a site or on particular receptors is we we take the noise levels existing and the, the noise impact assessment. The folk who do that, the consultants are able to take um, readings from similar situations and apply that to the existing background noise levels and that's how they come to the conclusion that um, whether, whether there's an, an impact or not. So it's just taking existing, sorry, readings from an existing similar type of situation and applying it to this particular site. Uh, can I have a supplementary chair? So in that case then, Tony, did they do the, the noise assessment on a light to light basis? Because you can do an assessment on a battery power plant and there's nothing in the immediate vicinity. We're not talking about that. We're talking houses are basically buttoned up against this plant. So was that light for light basis? No, what they would have taken, say, the, the readings from a, an existing plant elsewhere and, and something similar in scale and, and so on. Um, and applied that to the background noise levels, and f through that, really able to extrapolate whether there'd be an impact in terms of noise um, on on the on the receptors. Um, it wouldn't have been a like for like situation, but as I said, they can just take readings from elsewhere and apply them to um, to, to this current situation. How to how to hear? Okay, thanks, Tony. Thank you, Pauline you would come in? Thanks, Chair. It was just to draw members' attention to section 4.3 of your report, which discusses the, the noise assessment. It makes it clear that the applicant had to produce a noise impact assessment, which was then independently assessed by our own environmental health officers. And that also makes it clear that the potential impact on the showman travellers' village was taken into account as part of that process. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Pauline. I'll move the report. I'll second it, Chair. Chair, uh, obviously I've got my uh, amend my uh, my motion. Do you wish me to put it again? Yeah, that's fine. Well, I think it's sure have a note of that. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks. So, uh, just to clarify, Councillor Scott, you've moved that the planning application be refused on the grounds of loss of immunity to local residents and impact on economic development. Bang on, Stuart. Thank you so much. Yep. So that would be the amendment and the motion is to grant detailed planning permission subject to the conditions specified in the report. Motion being moved by Councillor Dorman, seconded by Councillor Horsham, and the amendment being moved by Councillor Scott and seconded by Councillor Thompson. So, taken by roll call, Councillor Anderson. Motion. Councillor Bradley. Motion. Councillor Brogan. Amendment. You've missed out, Councillor Allison. Sorry, I did that last time as well. Apologies, Councillor Allison. <laughs> beginning to wonder. Talk to me after this. I'm beginning to what I'll just remember you need me tomorrow. Uh, motion, please. Thank you. Councillor Buchanan. Motion. Councillor Burns. Amendment. Councillor Convery. Amendment. Councillor Kiwi. Amendment. Councillor Craig. Motion. Councillor Devlin. Amendment. 
Edmund. Councillor Donnelly. Motion. Councillor Dorman. Motion. Councillor Hamilton. Amendment. Councillor Harrow. Motion. Councillor Horsham. Motion. Councillor Law. Councillor Law, you might be on mute. Councillor Locke, yep, we can hear you now. Councillor Locke, can you please indicate either motion or amendment, please? Hello, Councillor Law. Aye, I'm here. Yeah, can you indicate motion or amendment, please? Motion. Thank you. Councillor McCallum. Motion. Councillor McCreary. Motion. Councillor Nalan. Motion. Councillor Nugent. Aye. Sorry, Councillor Nugent. Motion. Thank you. Councillor Scott. Amendment. Councillor Shearer. Motion. Councillor Thompson. Amendment. Councillor Walter. Councillor Walter. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I've, I've lost my sound. No, we can hear you okay. I oh, all right, motion. Thank you. Oh, sorry, somebody's got their microphone activated. If you can please mute. Thank you. Eight members have voted in favour of the amendment and 16 members have voted in favour of the motion. I therefore, declare the motion carried. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Agenda item five is application P21-1474, and that's in pages 43 to 56 in the last Tina to take the item. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Chair. As a planning application for the extension, erection of an extension to the existing distribution centre, um, it's BMW um, tenants at Dale Avenue in Cambus Lang. The application relates to uh, an established industrial unit. It's tenants, as I say, distri distribution uh, unit at Dale Avenue uh, off Bogleshole Road at Cambus Lang. Site is utilised as a storage and distribution facility comprising an existing large industrial building and a temporary storage facility, a yard area and car parking. The site extends to approximately 1.88 hectares. Access to the site is taken from Dale Avenue, which is a junction onto Bogleshole Road. The site is bounded to the south and southwest by the Cambus Line to Rutherglen Railway Line and beyond to residential properties to the west and northwest. In terms of the proposal to extend the buildings um, within the within their own site, the proposal is acceptable in terms of planning policy, which is the, the site already being zoned for employment land in LDP2 with an existing business and industrial uh, site zoning, so that the principle of development here is acceptable. Um, and there are no objections from uh, the, the statutory consultees that are set out in section four of the report. 
Um, however, in terms of representations, we have received 21 representations and four comments, sorry, 21 objections and four comments letters um, as set out in section five of the report. The main issue is really the conflict of the HGVs that access the site and use the site on a daily basis um, and parking on the road outside the site, um, together with the introduction of um, sorry, um, the parking outside the site um, and the comings and goings um, from, from the site it's, it itself. In response, um, we have been um, discussed the issue in great detail with the applicants. Um, the issue has been considered by our colleagues in Roads and Transportation, the Development Management Team, in discussion with the applicant's own uh, roads consultant. The site has space provision for parking um, of HGVs within the site, um, and that would be, there would be additional spaces created um, together with um, the introduction of um, additional loading areas, um, and conditions would be imposed, um, which would require the introduction of the on-site parking bays, um, and also a review would be undertaken regarding the on-street parking um, as we as we go forward, um, and in terms of consideration of any waiting restrictions and access to the to the site. Turning to our assessment and conclusion, it does form part, the site itself does form part of an existing industrial distribution premises and the new extension to the existing western elevation of the of the building um, is not incongruous. It would be, it's been well designed and we've been keeping with the adjoining building. The existing access linking with the existing road network is designed for industrial use by HGVs and adequate car parking um, service yards, including loading bays and HGV parking, um, as I say, would all be accommodated within the site. So therefore, after careful consideration um, and working with the, 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 the company's own transportation um, uh, experts, we've got no objection to the proposal. Um, roads are happy um, with the, the proposal subject to the conditions attached um, and therefore recommending approval. Thank you, Tina. Any questions or comments for Tina? Alec? Chair, I noticed most of the objections are around lorries parking on the public streets. There are a number of conditions in there covering parking, but would it not be simpler just to put a condition in that there will be no parking by ve for vehicles um, waiting to access or leave the property, or they've left the property. Would that not be simpler, just to ban all parking on public on the public road outside the premises? Maybe ask Fraser to come in on that point. <coughs> Thank you. Um, certainly that was considered, uh, Councillor. Um, however, there was quite a lot of work done to try and uh, resolve the issue of, uh, you know, to provide a facility for uh, lorries to do that. Um, what we do have then is obviously after six months we can do a review and see if there has been any parking and um, that probably be done with a video uh, survey of the area um, and if there was an issue then we could implement it. We don't like to put down restrictions where there might not be an issue um, because you know, um, people don't necessarily uh, respect the restrictions if they're not in the right place and um, so that's why we're we, we decided that it would be better to do a review in the first instance, um, but it was considered. Thank you, Fraser. Is that okay, Alec? Yeah, yeah I understand his reasoning, but I uh, think often a stitch in time saves nine. John? Hi, as a, as a local member, I know the area, Alec, so... The main entrance is off Bogles Hill Road. There would be no need to go anywhere near the estate that can, that where the houses are, are uh, objecting from. In fact, the exit from that road is more uh, inhibitory for, for lorries rather than uh, conducive for lorry access. So I, I don't really see where, the, where the, the parking issue arises in that area. OK, thanks, John. Thank you, John. Maureen? 
Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Chair. But I think George just answered the question. It was more, not so much the parking; it was more to do with the loading or unloading of the anything on the road. Because you know yourself, it can be mayhem in Almada Street up at parks whenever they're doing the deliveries. So you can answer that, John. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. I'll move the report. No second it, Chair. You do the report. Agreed. Thank you. Agenda item six, it's application P21-1126, and that's on pages 57 to 76, and I'll ask Bernard to take us through the item. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you, Chair. Approval of matters specified and condition is sought for the erection of a residential development containing 203 dwelling houses on land within the Hamilton Community Growth Area. The application has been submitted by Taylor Wimpey. The application site consists of undeveloped farmland, with the site being split in two by Michael Elnett Road. The southern boundary of the site is located just short of the Cadsall Burn, beyond which is further land which forms part of the Hamilton Community Growth Area. In terms of the details of the proposal, the submitted layout includes a variety of house types ranging from two-bedroom semi-detached to five-bedroom detached two-storey properties. The proposed dwellings would incorporate a variety of parking arrangements including in integral or detached garages, driveway parking and parking courts to ensure each property has appropriate parking provision based on the number of bedrooms. The development is split into two halves due to the location of Meek Leonard Road. Each part of the site would be accessed from Meek Leonard Road and a new roundabout would be constructed further along on Meek Leonard Road, which in the fullness of time will provide a link to a crossing over the Cadsall Burn and Straven Road beyond through the southern part of the Hamilton Community Growth Area. The layout includes pockets of amenity and open space in addition to a small play area and green corridors running along the site boundaries where appropriate. The site would incorporate sustainable urban drainage into its design. In terms of the local plan, the site is located within the Hamilton Community Growth Area and the principle of a housing development at this location is considered to be an appropriate form of development. No objections have been raised from consultees subject to the use of appropriate conditions and these comments are summarised in section 4 of the report. There were five objections to the application and the points raised are summarised in section 5 of the report, primarily relating to access, wildlife, traffic, street lighting, landscaping and drainage. These points are addressed. In general land use terms and policy terms, the principle of a residential development at this location is acceptable. The proposed development would allow the construction of further housing within the Hamilton Community Growth Area. The design, layout and scale of the development are considered to be acceptable, along with the impact on the surrounding area. Access to the application site would be taken from McLennan Road and it would form a continuation of existing residential development whilst, whilst also providing a link to a future crossing over the Cadsall Burn, which will allow an alternative route between McLennan Road and Straven Road to be formed as the, heat, as the community growth area prog progresses towards completion. There is a condition to be attached to control the phasing of the access. When planning permission in principle was granted for the community growth area, it was subject to a legal agreement requiring contributions to be paid and this will remain in place. A residential development at this location is an appropriate form of development and the proposal is considered to be acceptable. It's considered that the application complies with the relevant local plan policies and it's therefore recommended that the application is granted subject to conditions. Over to you, Chair. Thank you, Bernard. Bert? Thanks very much, Chair. Just a, a general question, and I may have missed it, but if it just enlighten me. Uh, are the, the planners confident that infrastructure is in place there for, like, say, shops, bus routes, and in particular roads? Got a lot of concern in that area over the year about roads. Are you quite happy that everything's OK and infrastructure's right in place? Thank you. Through you, Chair. Um, yeah, as, as part of this application, we'd look at um, getting bus stops put in on Michael Ernick Road. This um, phase, if you like, of the community growth area, it's, it's maybe not as big as some of the other developments that have gone on, but in terms of the access, it forms a link towards the council burn. And um, at one of the previous committees had mentioned that there are Another two planning applications that are with us just now, and it's for um, 
quite large developments closer to Straven Road. And again, there would be a need to be a discussion about the phasing and when that comes forward to the planning committee in due course. And that would relate to an actual crossing being formed over the Cadso burn. So this allows the developer to build up to the extent of their boundary, which is quite close to the Cadso burn. And then the other developers would have to work between themselves to ensure that a crossing was formed and thereafter a link through to Straven Road. So in the fullness of time, that will benefit and alleviate the um, traffic in the area. It's just obviously it's a large development and it will take a bit of time before we get to that point. Thanks, you. Thanks, Bernard. Thank you. Thanks, Bernard. I don't see any other hands, so I'll move the report. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, sorry, I think you was, was get his hand up. You're on mute, Joe. Right. Okay. All right. Yes, you can. Go ahead. <clears throat> As one of the councillors, Jack Fraser, will tell you there, he promised me him and Bernard uh, Dara promised me the new road it's already planned for to go across the Michelinard Road over to Straven Road. It's still no been done yet. And I'll tell you something, I don't know where you're going to put buses because there, there's chicanes there. I think the committee should go out and have a look at Straven Road and see how uh, this planning application has been moved forward. It's a nightmare at the present time. And if they build another 200 houses, hell bells, what's going to happen here? I think some, somebody should take it and go out and have a look at it. Pauline, I'll meet her any day and go out there and have a look at Michelinat Road. They promised, they promised to put a, a camera in to see the traffic coming down that road. Her one car ended up in somebody's garden, 142 Michelinat Road. It's unbelievable. So... I think we should have a good look at Michelinat Road before we make any planning applications here. Back Thanks, Joe. That's sitting there. Let's talk Fraser, do you want Jack. to come in that point? Yeah, thank you, Councillor. Um, it was really just to say that the, this development will start to form the road. Um, and you're quite right, Councillor, although the road's not in yet, um, it, it will take some time to do that. And as, as Bernard was explaining, the, the two applications that are currently being can, uh, reviewed at the moment uh, will connect up Straven Road to Meeklern Road um, and resolve the issues. Um, we've obviously been out at the site a number of times and uh, have been uh, encouraging particularly construction traffic uh, to use uh, the route via Martin Hall Road. And uh, we are reasonably happy that that's happening. There are obviously instances where some lorries go down, but um, the yeah. development <coughs> is right, yeah. good. They're coming off the Martin Hall Road down, the Michael Ernick Road. Where is it? That, that's, I mean, the, the, route and the, the construction traffic routing um, is largely um, from Martin Hall Road um, down into Meeklarnock Road. Um, and the, the thought behind that is that we don't want construction traffic going via the residential part of it. Um, we've been uh, written to all of the developers at high level. In fact, Michael McGlynn, before he left, um, wrote a letter to the developers to um, you know, get them to play ball and, and use that route. Um, I would like with, to see that then. Because it's it's never come near any of the councillors to to say what's happening here. Right? If you're happy with that, Jack, well, I'm no happy and I don't think the people will be happy. No, don't forget you're building on the in the Straven Road five hundred houses on the waterworks. Pauline, you wanted to come yeah. in? Thanks, Chair. I mean, I think 
members, this is one of our community growth areas, a very large housing development with a lot of infrastructure needing to be put in to make the development work. Um, the infrastructure as a whole has been agreed by, by you members as the outline application and then these matters reserved in condition, the detail applications are coming forward. A number of developers on site who build the infrastructure in an incremental way. So the infrastructure will never be on in up front because the infrastructure is built as the, as the development is, is built up over, over time. Um, I know there has been a number of concerns from local members because of the scale of development and the number of developers on site and as, as Fraser has outlined here um, we did write to the developers and asked them you know, to be conscious of local residents to act responsibly. Um, Bernard can maybe come in or Fraser just let because I know that at least one of the developers did respond to that and we're very happy to share that with members if it hasn't been shared but in the end of the day the the roads infrastructure will improve but it's not all going to be in until the end of the development but we can go on monitoring the work as it happens on site and try and alleviate any impacts on resident during, residents during the construction period thanks chair i want you to show me how you can Thank put you. another road in there and how you're going to make it the infrastructure and to help the, the people that's already there. No. I want to meet you out there and see what you're going to do because I've been through hell and high water with this, this road and what's happened. And the, the position is it was always kept at bay, but all of a sudden it just went off the beaten track. So I'm, I'm prepared to meet any of and show me just exactly what you are going to do. Well, you want to come back the in? promises that's been made to me hasn't materialised. Thanks, Chair. Through you, I'm very happy to organise a, a meeting with Councillor Lowe and the other ward members outside the committee process to explain the, how the infrastructure is going to be built and um, give them background oh. information on the community growth area, Chairman. Thanks. Thank you, Pauline. I'll move the report. Don't make it too long now. I'll second okay. it, Chair. Thank you. Agree <coughs> the report. Agreed. Thank you. Agenda item seven is application P21-1053, and that's on pages 77 to 86. And Tony will take us through the item. Thank you, Tony. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, just before I start presenting the, the report, um, it's just to make members aware that a request for a hearing was made um, last week. The, the request is being considered in terms of the guidance that we have on hearings, and we don't consider that it meets the criteria, so therefore the, um, the request has been denied. So going on to the report, the application seeks detailed retrospective permission for erection of a fence um, at 74 Kirkhill Gardens in Canvas Lang. The fence has been erected on the boundary between 74 and the adjoining property at 76. The fence has a high point of 1.9 metres and it drops to 1.26 metres at the point it adjoins the front elevation of the adjoining property. Um, the building line um, of Dublin 74 is set back by approximately 7 metres compared to that neighbouring property at 76. Um, the application site, the house, uh, it sits within a cul-de-sac comprising 14 houses. Uh, the cul-de-sac has a continuous footway to the front of all the properties in it. Um, we consulted roads on this particular application. Um, they've advised that in terms of visibility, when cars are leaving the two driveways either side of the fence, the applicant has submitted a drawing which plots the visibility space, which found that should the fence be no more than 0.9 metres in height for the first 1.18 metres behind the, the heel of the footway, the required visibility would be achievable. The applicant is actually proposing to reduce the first 1.92 metres of the fence to that height. Um, so that's in excess of road requirements and, and therefore it is acceptable. So we would attach, if permission is granted, a condition requiring the height of the fence to be reduced to the height of 1 point, sorry, 0 0.9 um, within one month of the date of consent. Following the carrying out of neighbour notification, and then six letters of objection from four separate households in the cul-de-sac have been received together with one letter of support. 
just go through a few of these um, points of objection. Firstly, that there's reference um, to the title deeds for these properties stating that no walls or fences um, in front of the building line of the houses should be erected. Um, the housing state was never designed to have fences around the front gardens and the layout isn't conducive to, conducive to fencing at the front. So in response to that, the contents of title deeds um, are a separate civil matter and they're not a material consideration for the assessment of, of this planning application. We've also um, looked to see if we can find evidence that a condition was attached to the original permission for the estate, um, preventing the erection of fences at the front of properties. Um, we, we can't find that evidence, um, but we do feel in, in, in general terms that the fence as erected is, is acceptable. Concerns have been raised about the visual appearance of the fence in the cul-de-sac. Um, in response, it's noted that there are other properties in Kirkhill Gardens and also the wider residential area that have erected fences and walls to visually and physically separate driveways. So a precedent for this type of development has already been established. The placement of the fence, it runs parallel to the house and not the pavement, so it doesn't close the whole of the front garden. That's meant that the, the enclosing effect to the property um, has not been created, and therefore it's considered the open plan nature of the street has not been adversely affected. An objection has also been made about the view from the side and front windows of the adjoining property in number 76. The highest part of the fence does not directly face the front elevation of that property as it sits behind the building line of it. Um, it does face the side of the property where, where views of the fence can be seen directly from a side ground floor window. Um, however, the right to a view is not a, a material plan consideration and it's not grounds to review as a planning application. In any event, this kind of relationship, the fence with a side window, it's common in, in, in most housing estates. The occupiers of 76 Kirkland Gardens have, have advised that they're unable to use their driveway as they can no longer open doors because of the fence that's been erected. This has resulted in cars being parked on the street, which they consider is unsafe and makes parking cars in driveways difficult for residents and creates general congestion in the cul-de-sac. The, the introduction of the fence as called difficulty is obviously for the occupants of that property um, in that they can't now open car doors properly. Um, so um, while cars associated with that property are parked on the road instead of the driveway, there aren't any road restrictions, parking restrictions in place on the street and roads of transportation haven't raised any objection to this impact. It's therefore considered it wouldn't be reasonable to refuse application for these, for these reasons. In addition, driving around the wider estate, it's shown that on-street parking is a common feature in, in the area. And finally, final point is about visibility uh, being poor for re reversing out the driveway. Um, as I mentioned before, roads and transportation, transportation have consulted on the application. They've advised they have no objections as long as part of the fence is reduced to 0.9 metres. The applicant has agreed to carry out this work, and as I said, a condition will be imposed if permission is granted to ensure this happens. So just turning to the conclusions, in terms of the impact on the street scene, it's not considered that the fence has a dominant impact, largely due to reduced height when it moves forward of the property at 76 Kirkhill Gardens. That house actually acts as a backdrop to the fence, which further reduces the impact. And a planning condition would be imposed requiring the fence to be stained in order to, to soften its impact on the streetscape. The fence has made use of the joint driveway difficult, as I mentioned, um, and this has resulted in cars parking on the street and a number of concerns are being lodged in terms of impact on, on road safety. However, it has to be said that under permitted development rights, a fence up to a metre in height could be erected without the need for plan permission, um, which if that was the case, that would have resulted in that scenario in any event. And in addition, planting, landscaping, etc., could be provided um, to any height along that boundary without the need for any consent from the council. So that issue is kind of this where it's happened now is it's a fallback position. I think you would you would describe it as um, the real restrictions on street parking. Um, as I said, in addition, roads and transportation happy with the the sight lines that are proposed. So taking all this together, we're, we're happy that there's no impact on road safety or the visual impact of the area, visual amenity of the area. Sorry and we're recommending consent be granted. Thank you, Tony. Peter? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I have to say, Tony, I'm, uh, I do get the, the, some of the objections that have been made to this. You know, uh, 
all the all the modern estates now are reliant on those sort of twin driveways uh, and the ability to open a door onto the other person's property and to enable you to get out. So uh, I'm just wondering, is it? Uh, I know that we don't have any specific uh, conditions attached to to this state, but uh, given that this is part of modern life, is there any way that we should be looking at uh, new building developments and, and making allowances for that sort of thing to happen? Is that possible? I, I think through you, Chair, um, we, we don't have a record of when this, when the planning permission for the original estate was granted. It looks like it's an estate that was built in the 70s or 80s. Um, and I think it's fair to say the guidelines and the standards then are a lot different to what they are now. And when we come to to assess an application for new housing, we, we do consider parking um, number of spaces per unit so, so it, it it meets the needs of the household, but also it's the fact that it's usable is always taken into consideration. So I would like to think that this scenario wouldn't happen um, in, in now, but say going back to the 70s, 80s, it probably wasn't a big issue. Car ownership wouldn't have been as um, as prevalent as it is now, so that's probably why that's that's happened. Thanks, Tony. Bert? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just quickly, just an observation, really. Anything with traffic, as far as I've been, in any case I've pulled up, anything to do with, if a car's taxed and insured, it's legal to sit where it is, and the same in your driveway. It's nothing to do with MD, the council, or anything, if everything is above board, but the police will not get involved. The same with parking on the pavement. As a council, or these people, I think it's a civil matter here. Have they got together or are they willing to get back together to try and sort things out between themselves about arbitration? It might be better than, than what's happening here because it seems like, uh, you know, it just seems to be going on and on. It's better getting on with each other than they live with each other. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Bert. <sighs> Sorry, don't if you want to come in there, Tony? Um, I don't think so. No, I, I, mean, I think you, um, Councillor Thompson was right in that some of the issues that have been raised here are probably private legal ones, um, particularly in terms of what the title deed says. Um, and there's no on-street parking restrictions. Um, and, and roads have looked at this particular application in, in a bit of detail, and they don't consider it's it's necessary going forward. So I think um, I think we're happy with 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 that. Okay, thank you, Alec. Practical point, Chair. Tony, one of the conditions you're going to do is to stain to make sure the fence is a particular colour. It's a two-sided fence, so does that mean that the applicant is allowed to go onto the neighbour's drive if the fence is to be made a different colour to what it is, or are you going to make them take it down to paint it and then put it back up? Yeah, <laughs> yeah through you, Chair. Um, Yes, I mean, the, the, the right of access over so the person's property to carry out work is, is a private legal matter. Um, I mean, there might be a way of, of painting certainly the lower part of the fence without having to encroach on, on the adjoining driveway. Um, but no, we, we couldn't come involved in, in that particular situation. I think what you're saying is there could be a breach of condition here and we'd have to take account of whether we thought it was reasonable to to, to, to take action in that particular case. Um, but hopefully not. Hopefully common sense will prevail. Yeah, it's not very common. Thanks, Tony. But equally, when they built the fence, did they have to go on the neighbour's driveway to build the fence if it's a double-sided fence? From from looking at the, 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 the fence on site and photographs, it looks like the posts have been erected along the boundary and then this, the, the wooden fence slats have been attached to the fence um, from that sat, from the applicant's property, so I don't think it looks like there's been any encroachment onto um, onto other land, but uh, we, we don't know. Um, I think is the answer to that. But it, it looks like it could have been done without having to um, go through that. Thanks, Tony. Kenny. Thanks, Chair. I must say, um, it's not really a question for anybody, but if I was the people at number seventy six, I think I'd, I I would be complaining as well. That little fence seems a bit petty, doesn't it? I think having seen the picture. The big one I can kind of understand because it, it blocks the the, the 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 window view, if you like. But the little fence at the front is just what's the what's the point of it other than to sort of define the boundary? 
So, you know, I don't suppose we can stop it, but as I said, I, I kind of don't like I don't like the look of it, to be honest, but uh, I don't suppose there's anything we can do to, to have it removed, but there we go. Just a comment. Thank you. Thanks, Kenny. John? John Bradley? I, I was contacted by the by the owners of this uh, of number seventy six to make an objection to it, and I, I pointed out I was on the planning committee and I couldn't get involved it, unless they wanted me to make a representation. But um, however, um, I'm sort of semi on their side uh, to a certain extent, but I, I realise that this this is a contentious issue about uh, building a fence on the boundary line. It, it's not really conducive for good relationship with your next door neighbour. There is a recommendation to reduce the height. How is that going to be achieved? Are they just going to take a chainsaw to the top of the fence? Or are they going to take the fence down altogether uh, and rebuild it at a lower height? It seems ridiculous that we can't uh, impose the conditions that were imposed uh, that are in the title deeds to prevent uh, people building these fences to narrow the, the, the ability to open a car door, it, it, it seems to me that we're pretty powerless in all, all these things when it comes to boundary disputes on shared driveways. There needs to be some sort of tie-up between the title deeds and the planning authority uh, to alleviate these recurring uh, things that go on time after time after time on boundary disputes. And I'm sure the planning people are well aware of this. It's a bit ridiculous that we can't say, no, you're not getting planning permission. You stuck the fence up without permission. You're not getting it. Take it down. You can keep the six foot fence part, but not the, not the small fence at the beginning. That's my, my thinking on it uh, for what it's worth. Thanks, John. Monica, you want to come in? <clears throat> Thank you, through you, Chair. Um, it was just really um, to perhaps give a bit of an explanation in, in regards to the legal position um, in relation to, to title restrictions. Um, as the Planning Authority are aware, um, the, the Planning Authority's duty today is to make the um, to determine the application in accordance with the development plan unless there are relevant material considerations which would indicate otherwise. Um, unfortunately, title restrictions, which may prevent the development from any development from going ahead, are not considered material considerations. The reason for that is because um, these restrictions can, for example, be discharged. They can be discharged by the proprietors going to the land tribunal to ask for them to be discharged. Um, and therefore, to stymie development in that way has is, is been held to be unlawful. Um, and, and that's really just to give an explanation as to why they're not considered relevant material considerations and planning determinations and why we really, our hands are really tied legally in terms of, of what planning can, can, can do to control development where there are underlying title restrictions. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Monica. Lynn? Thanks, Chair. Um, this is this is one of those applications that, to my mind, defies common sense completely. Um, this fence could go ahead. The um, owners of the property that can't open the car doors and therefore use the drive as a driveway will need to go to some sort of court with a great deal of stress and expense. Um, there's definitely a, a gap here. There's no joined up thinking between uh, common sense civil matters and planning legislation which I think in, the, in going forward needs to be looked at. However, in this case, instead of allowing a fence to go up on the driveway, can we not insist that instead boundary markers are installed that are obvious physical markers, but that still allow, because they're at such a low height, still allow people to open the car doors and use the driveways for what they're intended and get the cars off the road? I think that's a very good suggestion. John, did you want to come back in? Sorry, Chair, that's all I can say. Okay, thank you. Tony, do, do, if you want to respond to Lynn's question. Y yes, do you check, uh, Councillor Lillian? I mean, I think um, we have to determine what's before us today and what we have is the situation where a fence has been erected along the boundary. So that that is what we're taking a decision on. I would say as well that um, 
it, it, this issue has been published on the portal, but there was a, a statement submitted by the by the applicant that um, says, in effect, that their car had been damaged um, but as a result of activity by the, the, the neighbour. So I think they probably put that fence up to to address that. Um, so there's always a always a background to these issues, but uh, that that's the reason why they've they've put forward this this proposal. But we have to determine what's in front of us today. Thanks, Johnny. Mark. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, no, I agree with with with, with Lynn. There's, there sort of seems to be a sort of it's not an attachment to the legal side and the the, the planning side. And as I spoke to Tony about this. Uh, you know. The, pro the problem I've got, and probably I'm going to use in my ward, is we have cul sats like this in, in Blackwood. And recently, there is a lot of cars being parked in, and the bin lorries can't get down. So they refuse to empty the bins. This is taking away a space that, you know, on the, on the road. Now, looking at the, the, the driveway, this person will need to erase this as well. And the, the person needs to reverse in if he wants to open his his driver's side door. The turning circle for reversing in can be a lot harder than driving in forward. And this is sort of restricting that person. Has this person got a disability? Has he got young children where they need to use that sort of side and get buggies out, whatever, you know? So I think this is taking away, you know, a wee bit, you know, <laughs> it's, it's sort of hard to explain, you know, but it's not letting them, it's a driveway. You know, and it's not giving them the use of a driveway, and they might need use of that driveway, whoever the owner is or the the future owners. Um, but as you say, it's uh, there's the the legal side as well, so I take that on board as well. Thank you, Mark. Um, I agree. Sorry, Kenny, you want to come back in? Th th thanks, Chair. G given the fact there seems to be some. Um, resistance to this amongst uh, amongst the committee. Could I maybe ask what our options are here? Is there anything we can do? And it's especially given it's retrospective, they haven't come to come to us in advance to ask for the planning permission. So, what what, what are our options today? That's my question. Thanks. Thanks, Kenny. Monica, do you want to come in at that point? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair, through you. Um, the options for the, the committee today are, are, are the, the options that, that are always available to the, the committee. We can um, grant the application, um, you can grant it subject to condition, you can refuse the application. Um, there is an option to move to defer the application as well, but usually that option would, would really only be where you required further information to enable you to make a determination. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Monica. John? I would move to refuse on the basis that uh, they, they, they should refer to their title deeds for the for the conditions of a uh, building offence. Right. I would second that refusal. Thanks, Mary. David Shearer, you want to come in? Yeah, thanks, Chair. I was looking for a middle way, if it was at all possible. Could this be deferred subject to negotiation or mediation between the parties? Because this really isn't a planning issue. It's much more a neighbour dispute. So would that be possible as a, as a middle way to try and find a solution that's suitable for both parties? Thank you, Chair. Thanks, David. John, John Bradloff, would you think to that? I, I would agree with you. David's and, and withdraw my motion. Yeah, thanks. Um, Alec, you want to come in? Sorry, yeah. I'm just a little bit concerned here that we are thinking about instructing one homeowner uh, to allow access over his own ground by another homeowner. I don't know that we have that right. I can understand the problems, narrow driveways from a different era, um, but how can we instruct someone to allow access to their ground by a neighbour? I don't think that's right. I'll bring Pauline Elliott in at that point. 
I think just on the point that Councillor Allison's made, I'd like Monica to just answer that specific point and I can maybe come in after, Chair, if that's all right, thanks. <coughs> Apologies, um, Chair, I was, I was on mute there. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, uh, yes, in terms of uh, um, Councillor Allison's point, um, Effectively, and what 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 one the, the party have constructed the fence have done have built a fence on their land, which they are in, entitled to do unless there are title restrictions stopping them to do that. Um, and the parties capable of enforcing any title restrictions are the neighbouring proprietors, not not the planning authority. Um, in terms of the, the the options that have that have been muted um, today. I would say if the planning authority were minded to refuse the application, um, the the authority would have to be mindful of the fact that um, the reasons for refusal um, have to be proper planning reasons, um, or else there, there is obviously a risk of appeal in terms of, of, of the refusal, in terms of deferring the application. Again, the reasons for the deferral um, should be be relevant reasons um, in, in terms of perhaps seeking further inf information. Um, it wouldn't normally be a reason for deferral would be to allow um, parties um, to um, to look to arbitrate issues that are civil matters because they're not usually planning con considerations. Um, and if, if that was the decision made, there is also the option that the, the applicant could appeal for non-determination um, depending on the, t the timescales of the application. Um, um, I, I don't think I think hopefully I've covered all the points if there's anything that was that, that I haven't um, if you, you let me know Chair Thanks Monica Pauline do you want to come back on that point? Yeah, thanks, Chair. I mean, Monica's touched on some of the points I was going to make. I think the, the difficulty here, members, is that there's issues about really a breakdown in relationship between neighbours and parking on a cul-de-sac where people have a, have a, a lot more cars now than um, the, the cul-de-sac was intended to take at the time when the, the houses were built are kind of being confused with, with planning issues. Just to, to remind neighbours, um, the house owner can build a fence at a height of one metre without permission, but it would still cause issues with the car door. And they can build a hedge or something that would cause issues with a car door that could be considerably higher than, than one metre. Um, so, you know, from that point of view... Um, it's not really going to make any difference. So just, you know, I think members either have to approve the application or refuse it. Um, but you have to have quite strong reasons for refusing it. And also just used to say that the house owner could build a fence to, to one metre. Um, but I think it would be great if the, the house owners would go to mediation. It'd be great if people could get along. And I think we'd have a lot less to deal with in, in planning if, if that were the case. And indeed, I think I've mentioned to you members on, on several occasions now that our enforcement caseload has more than doubled since the pandemic. That I think people are in their houses a lot and they're not getting on too well with their neighbours and, and planning keeps getting caught up in that. Um, but the issues for us is, is the fence lawful? It's actually too high. We're trying to get them to reduce the height of the fence to make it lawful. And we can't find anything um, in the planning um, permissions because it's too long ago that would uh, enable us to do anything about that, albeit there might be in the title deeds, which would be a civil matter for the owners. Um, and the other thing, members is even if we um, refuse the fence, the fence is reduced it's not going to stop people parking on the streets because they're entitled to park on the streets and there'll still be congestion um, whether it's a fence here or not because even if people can use their drive, we think people can use their, they can use their drive at the moment albeit there might be difficulty it might be tight, they might have to get off on, on the, the road and then reverse and passenger might have to get off on the road sorry, and then reverse in but just because the drive is usable it doesn't mean that people are going to use it. Human nature means that probably if it's more convenient for them, people are going to park on the street. So um, just some issues to think about. Thanks very much. Thanks, Pauline. Jerry? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I've listened to this for quite a long time. Alec, Alison's 100% correct. This is nothing to do with planning. 
At the end of the day, the person who's built a fence on their land, if we, which we've got no right to do, told them to take the fence down to allow the next door neighbour to access the person's land to open their car door, I, I don't see why we're discussing this. <clears throat> it's two neighbours that obviously are fell out and they can't get on. That's nothing at all to do with planning. <laughs> There's no grounds whatsoever to refuse uh, th th this application as it stands in now. We can't demand anybody does anything in their own property. And that's a dangerous road to start to get down because yeah, yeah. God knows where we'd end up. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Caddy? Thanks, Chair. Uh, maybe I misheard Pauline, but I think she said that the fence, as it currently stands, is unlawful. If that's right, then we can surely tell them to take the fence down, put in a planning a, a application for a fence that is lawful, and then you know, and, and then it's decided under delegated powers. But the fence at the moment, and maybe Monica or Pauline will correct me, is unlawful. So surely we have the powers to get me to to remove it. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Kenny. To, to clarify, Chair, sorry, through you, um, the fence is, is above the height um, that is permitted, so we're actually asking them to reduce the height of the fence, and there's a condition on that, but they could still build a one-metre fence with, with no permission. Thanks, Pauline. John Bradley, you want to come back in? Oh, on the basis on the basis that Kenny had just raised there, the, the fence is, as it currently stands is illegal. We can ask them to take that fence down and resubmit a further application to build a fence to the proper height. Can we do that? I don't see why not. Monica? Um, through, through you, Chair, um, my understanding is the application, um, as part of the application process, they've agreed to reduce the height of, of the application. Is that correct, Tony? Perhaps Tony would be better. Um, yeah. So that really is what you're determining today, um, because that is the recommendation from the officer. Yeah. <clears throat> Just to clarify, that the highest part of the fence is 1.9 metres. It then drops to 1.26 metres uh, when it meets the building line of the adjoining house. The condition that's attached to the to the paper part requires the first two metres of the fence to be reduced to 0.9 metres, and that's to um, to maintain sight lines. But if if we were to approve this today, the, so the first two metres will be 0.9, the next five metres will be 1.26, and the rest will, will be 1.9. So most of it will still be unlawful, and um, just the first two metres wouldn't be. If, if that was approved, but obviously grant consent would make it lawful, but that's that's the situation. Thanks, Tony. Joe, you want to come in? Yeah. All you need to do, the planning people can go to floor 11 and that'll give them the title deeds for the holy the South Lanarkshire. They can get title deeds to every house and if people are breaking the, the the title deeds, they're against the law. So then they come to us and we we can give them planning permission for the proper thing. But at the same time as you've got to be careful that you're no blocking any envelope in. So I would say to you, check it out first before you bring it here for the planning. Thanks, Joe. Okay. So I'm very unhappy about this uh, proposal as well. I think it does affect amenity and the, the neighbours can't use their driveway. They have to park on the road and that's causing road safety issues and that is difficult for, or it could be difficult potentially for emergency services and for their bins to be emptied. So I'm not happy to move this report. So I don't know, does anyone else get any comments you want to make? Kenny? Thank, thanks, Chair. Well, well, given that and given what's been said, um, if John wants to maybe reinstate his original motion, I'd be quite happy to second it. 
or if if necessary, I'll raise the motion to refuse this um, and and have it removed. And another planning application um, and, and stated that there's, there's, you know people shouldn't be doing planning. Uh, it should be, shouldn't be a thing as such a, a thing as retrospective planning commission. People should come for planning commission before they put things up, as far as I'm concerned. So that's my thoughts on it. I'm happy to take, uh, take John's view on it. Thank you. Thanks, Kenny. John? Happy to second Kenny's uh, new motion. So, sorry, Chair, can I just come in? Um, Councillor Donnelly had already seconded the proposal earlier put forward by Councillor Bradley, so Councillor Donnelly would need to give permission for that. Um, amendment motion to be withdrawn. Thanks, Stuart. Mary, do you want to come in on the point? Uh, so, sorry, with... sorry, can I just sorry, can I just clarify sorry. that so, is it the original amendment put forward by Councillor Bradley that you're you're still wishing to put forward? Well, I, Kenny intimated he was happy to put the forward on motion, so I was happy to second it. So, uh, because I was drawn technically uh, after the, the Stramash uh, and yeah. going with uh, David's suggestion. Yeah, you, you, you had withdrawn it, but Councillor Don hadn't given that permission. So, if you're still wanting that to stand, mm -hmm. the only thing I would say is that we would need to just clarify with the Monica, because my understanding was that you were. Um, Moving that planning permission be refused on the grounds that the erection of the fence is contrary to the title deeds. Yes, that's correct. Um, but uh, we we're, were going with the, the Kenny's motion that the, the erection of the fence is illegal. Uh, it needs to be taken down and a new new application set forward. Is that right, Kenny? Well, that's it. I'm happy to. I'm happy to. Go either way if it's if it's easy for John's motion, which I think is was the same as mine anyway. Um, to uh, I'm quite happy to withdraw my my motion and go with John's. Or if it's if they're both the same, then you know let's do that. If mine is different from John's, can't quite remember what John's was. Then um, you know let's reinstate mine either way. Is that okay with you, Mary? Absolutely, I'll go with whatever. Is there a difference between your motion and Kenny's? Stuart? Yeah, so, so my understanding is Councillor Bradley in the first instance had moved that plan permission be refused on the grounds that the direction of the fence was contrary to the title deeds. And what now is being proposed is that um, the fence is removed as it's illegal. Right. Yeah, let's go with that. Yeah, go with Let's that. Go, uh, yeah, and I'll withdraw my seconding of John's original motion. Okay, thank okay. you. Jerry? Thanks, Chair. Monica, could you, for every elected member listening to this debate, tell us? Let's say there's no fence there. The person who's objecting to the fence, the only way they can open their door. It's to go into another person's property. Yes or no? Well, effectively, yes, yes. If what they're saying is the door, um, just to kind of give a bit of an, an explanation for ownership in Scotland, which is different to other parts of the UK, when we own land, we own from refers to the sense of the earth to the heavens above. So you own all the way down, all the way up. So you effectively own the airspace as well. Um, um, so yes, to open the door, potentially they are going on to land. But again, that would be an issue for neighbouring proprietors to these, not, not for the planning authority. Yeah, I, I understand totally what you're saying. But the fair, how, how, Tony, before we go into all this stuff, Tony, how high is the fence illegal? It runs into inches, doesn't it? So, the, the first seven metres is about 20, 20 millimetres too high. Um, sorry, 20 centimetres too high. Um, the rest of the fence, when it gets beyond the building line of number 76, it's about 90 centimetres too high. So what's that? I mean, I, I'm the old school. 20 centimetres, um, 20 centimetres, about 8 inches. 
he insists. So we're going to ask this person, he take down a fence, get through all the rigmarole again, we can put up a, he can put up a fence, it's a metre high, they still can't open their, their car door. Are we really going to put, we, we, we as a council, really going to put ourselves up for absolute ridicule for the sake of eight inches? It beggars belief. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Alec? Just on the same point, I mean, all due respect to Kenny, etc., there will not be another planning application because they do not need to put a planning application in if it's not above a metre high. So quite simply, if we refuse this, the, uh, the fence will be cut 20, 20 what is it, centimetres lower and it won't have made a blind bit of difference. So whereas I do feel for them, uh, but that's the house, no due respect, that's the house they've bought with that problem. It was designed in a bygone age, to be quite honest, um, and whatever decision we take today, they are not going to be able to open a car door. Spot on. Thanks, Alec. Graham? Thank you, Chair. Again, it's, I am deeply concerned by, and hopefully Monica can come in, by the legal competency of what John Bradley and, and Kenny McCreevy are, are, are putting forward in terms of their motion. They cannot, and it's a, it's a great point made by, by Alec Allison and, and, and Jerry Convery, is that you cannot force the applicant who has made a commitment to reduce the size of it already. She has made a legal commitment to, to accept that someone can open their car doors into land that they have. You're taking that person's right away. That's why... I'm deeply concerned by references in the motion that's been put by Councillor Bradley and Councillor McCleary that the, the mention be made of legal title. That's nothing to do with the council. That's a private matter between the parties. So we cannot get bogged down in, in this stuff. I feel very sorry for the person who can't open their car door. Of course I am. But legally, the person, that, I think it's number 76, has a legal right to do what they have done. End of story. And hopefully Monica can come in and, and cement that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I'll bring in Councillor John Anderson first. Yeah, I think Graham and Jerry and, and Alex have sort of covered it. I mean, the reality is here, I think we can only say to somebody, you need to abide by the law which means that we can only say to them, you need to have your fence within the legal parameters, not that we can say you need to take it down. And Graham's right, if they've already committed to doing that, then I just can't see how we can say to somebody, take down your fence and then put in planning permission. They don't need planning permission for a one metre fence. They don't need planning permission for a hedge, which will be much higher than, than one metre. So if they have agreed and we say to them, you must comply with the law, or your fence must comply with the law. That's it. You know, I just cannot see us saying to somebody, take down your fence, no matter how many inches it is, or feet, or metres. We don't have the authority, I don't think, within the law, to say to somebody, take, we have got the authority to say to them, your fence, the height of your fence must comply with the legislation. But to me, that's all we can say to them. And if they've already agreed to that, I just think we should move on to the next business because I think we could be here all day. That's that's just my opinion, Chair. Thanks, John. Well, Stuart, do you want to go to a vote? Um, yeah, but just first of all, as clarify, um, Monica, that you are satisfied that the, the proposal is competent? Um... Obviously, it is for the planning authority to determine the application as they, fee, they see fit, and it is for the, the planning authority. Within that, the, the planning authority has the right to refuse an application. Um, my legal advice in terms of um, refusing the application as proposed would be that um, that, 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 in my view, would be challengeable. Um, and it also I would have to highlight to the planning authority that um, <clears throat> if um, 
determining an application or refusing an application um, based on a known planning reason um, can um, be a reason for a finding of unreasonable behaviour on the part of the planning authority. Therefore, if a claim for expenses was made on that basis, that that's something else that, that um, well, it's just another possibility um, that if it was appealed, that a claim could be submitted um, for expenses in, in relation to um, um, in, in relation to the, the appeal on the basis of the reason for refusal. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Monica. Peter? Yeah, just on a technical issue, Chair, you've already said that you don't you don't want to move uh, the paper as uh, we have in front of us. So can I get someone to, to move the paper as in front of us and someone to second that and then we can go to a vote? Chair, I'm happy to move it. I'll second it. Yeah, um, I was going to move it as well, OK. OK, quite a few hands up still, so... Um, Next one was John Bradley. Based, based on what Monica has said uh, with regard to the legal advice, I, I just, I'm a bit annoyed about the people putting the fence up without getting planning permission and putting the fence up uh, above the recommended height. And I know they've accepted that they're going to reduce the height I think we should uh, impose a condition that, that 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 we are unhappy with with their with their fair procedure and that the the reduction of the height of the fence must take place immediately. Uh, some sort of uh, endorsement to prevent this thing happening again um, with others might be a, a way of. Uh, a way forward, and I would be happy to withdraw uh, my motion, but with the condition that that is enforced immediately. I don't know how you feel, Kenny, but it, it, this certainly looks like we're going to get defeated anyway. Uh, I know it's it's a dodgy issue, and it's a moral issue more than a, a legal issue, and uh, perhaps we're getting tied down in uh, emotional uh, nonsense rather than <laughs> Uh, looking at things from a clinical perspective. Thanks, John. I'll bring Mary in. I'll bring Kenny in. Uh, yeah, I think I think this planning committee is always having problems with retrospective applications, and maybe that is an issue that we need to deal with as a committee uh, going forward. But I think I would be right in saying this is the last planning committee. Uh, and it would be the new council that would need to look at that. But I think that is an issue that we need to actually address. Um, and I'm I'm glad uh, I would support John's withdrawal um, because I think having heard all the points of view, then we maybe are, in Monica's view, we probably are on thin ice uh, with this one. So... I would just be for it going through and if I don't think we've got any other way to go. Thanks, Mary. We've actually got a planning committee at the end of next month. So that's, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's in the last one. Kenny? Thanks, Chair. With, with respect uh, to Monica, I'm kind of surprised that the legal advice is we don't have powers to take it down given the fact that it's an illegal fence. However, Let's not get into all that again. Um, the, the fact of the matter is we're not going to win it anyway, so there's no point in keeping this keeping this going. But to John's point, can we perhaps put a definite time scale on the reduction of this fence um, as part of the conditions and maybe the staining? Because it doesn't look good if we've all, all seen these pictures. Um, so can we say, for example, by, you know, give them four weeks or so to, to, to do it? And then if not, we take some kind of uh, enforcement action. That'd be my thoughts. Thanks, Chip. And and I would withdraw. What you know, given formally, I'll withdraw that uh, that motion. Then, thank you. Thanks, Kenny. Pauline. Thanks, Chair. Um, the, first of all, to cover the points raised by Councillor Donnelly, I, I know committee that you do have an issue with retrospective applications, um, but it's not unlawful. Um, to lodge a retrospective application and, and it won't be I mean some I mean I know that you think that a lot of developers do it on purpose and try and get away with it 
but there are other applicants who genuinely make up like you know do work in error and then have to get a retrospective permission so we have to treat a retrospective application in the same way as we would treat a fresh application uh, members might be interested to know that um planning fees are going up we've had notification of that and we'll be coming to you with the detail of that going forward and there is going to be an increase in a fee for a retrospective application but you probably won't be as happy to know that they're only going to be a 20, 25% more expensive for a retrospective application and we, we were hoping for, for double. Um, just on the points that Councillor Bradley made about the timing, if you look at the conditions on the application on page 84 of your agenda, you, you'll notice that we're asking the application um, the applicant um, to reduce the height of the fence and do the staining within, four, within a month. So the four weeks that have been referred to, so that's already covered in the report. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Pauline. So I, I think we rather reluctantly have to accept this one. Oh, Tonya, you want to come back in? Yeah, I'm loath to, but I'm just, just to clarify that the condition requires only the first two metres of the fence to be reduced in height. The remainder, as it stands, would 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 remain as as existing. Um, and members can obviously put a condition on to say the rest of the, the, the first seven metres will all be reduced to a height to, to one metre, but as somebody said, it's only eight inches, so it's not really going to make an awful lot of difference to the situation that we've been talking about. But just to clarify that matter. OK, thank you, Tony. So then, will we agree the report? Agreed. Agreed. OK, now we should have had a break at 11 o'clock, so we've overrun the time a wee bit, so if we reconvene at 12, is that OK? OK. OK, thank you.
Yeah, thanks, Jay, for just bigger off me. I just need to restart the recording first. Yeah, I'm just going to restart the recording first. Yeah, thanks, Jay, for just Okay, yeah, if I can just um, do the sedent again, please, by roll call. Councillor Alec Allison. Here. Councillor John Anderson. Here. Councillor John Bradley. Here. Councillor Arch Buchanan. Here. Councillor Jackie Burns. <coughs> Councillor Burns. Councillor Margaret Kerry. Here. Councillor Peter Craig. Present. Councillor Maureen Devlin. Present. Councillor Mary Donnelly. Here. Here. Councillor Dorman's present. Councillor Lindsay Hamilton. Here. Councillor Ian Harrow. Here. Councillor Mark Colstrom. Here. Councillor Joe Law. Councillor Ian McAllen. Here. Councillor Lynn Nalen. Present. Councillor Carol Nugent. Here. Councillor Graham Scott. Here. Councillor David Shearer. Here. Councillor Bert Thompson. Here. Councillor Jim Morta. Here. I understand the Councillor Brogan's had to leave. Councillor Jerry Convery. Here, I'm sure. Yep. Councillor Kenny McCreary. Here, Stuart. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Moving on to agenda item eight, and that's the application P21-1869, and that's in pages 87 to 98 in the last year to take us for the item. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is a detailed planning application by Barrett West, uh, Scotland, for a uh, substitution of house types at Harvester Avenue in Cambus Lang, really just before committee because of the, the scale of um, the, the size of the site. Um, the applicants, Barrett, are proposing um, a substitution of house types. It previously had consent um, for this pod um, for Taylor Wimpy, but it's a, a different developer. So they're putting in their own uh, house types and an additional 10 units within the site. Um, it is a mixture of detached and uh, terraced houses. Um, so we're satisfied that the additional units can be accommodated within the boundaries of the, of the site and still meet our residential development guide. So it fully complies with policy. It forms part of the designated community growth area in Newton and is allocated as a, a housing site within that. Um, no objections from consultees set out in section four of the report subject to conditions. Sorry, just losing my, my page. Um, statutory neighbour notification was carried out um, and there were two um, letters of objection um, or concern um, and these points have been summarised in section five of the report. Um, they really just relate to um, issues about um, localised issues in terms of the landscaping um, and the blocking of, of sunlight um, in terms of the, the replanting. Um, but the, the landscape uh, plan has been revised um, and if permission is granted, a condition would be attached requiring further landscaping. Um, just turning to our conclusion and assessment, uh, the application is for 115 units and as I say it's a, a, a mix of house types, semi-detached, detached and terrace properties. Um, it meets our residential development guide and it's within um, an already designated pod within the, the master plan area for the community growth area, therefore recommending approval. Thank you Tina. Any questions or comments for Tina? <coughs> Alec? Yeah, um, what happens then with the uh, various agreements would be with the previous applicant regarding 
um, planning gain, etc., contribution towards the ed education, etc. With the increased uh, number of houses, is that varied? Thanks, Alex. Tina? Yeah, um, it, it really was it, all the, the legal agreement was signed and finalised prior to any of the developers being on site. So that would still stand. Um, in the case of Newton, the developers, um, the lead developers, um, Taylor Wimpey, um, took on the cost in, um, for most of the, the school um, over seven years. Um, and that stands. So it, it doesn't vary because it's not a, a roof tax as such. It was it was um, set amounts. Um, um, so it doesn't change. Thank you, Gina. Lynn? Thanks, Chair. Um, just because we've been um, affected by this previously, I've just noticed the word substitution of house types, and previously we've had substitutions and amendments to planning applications for this particular area mm -hmm. that have resulted in larger houses, been built than originally anticipated, which affected the school roll numbers. Um, I'm just wondering, are these houses going to be larger than the ones that were originally um, applied for? Thanks, Lynn. Tina? Uh, yes, through you, Chair. Uh, generally not, although I'm saying generally because it's one layout going to a completely different um, set of house types. But the fact that there are, um, this does include terraces um, and semi-detached, um, then I wouldn't think generally there's there's an issue of it going to bigger houses. Um, but I'd have to look at the two side by side. Um, but uh, not, I, I don't think so. I don't think there's a concern here in, in that regard. Thank you. Can I ask a supplementary chair if that's all right? Yes, go ahead. Um, if there is um, going, going to be, if there is, if you do uncover the fact that there is going to be a noticeable potential increase, will education be kept appraised of that? Thank you. Thank you. Tina? Yes, I, I as I say, it hasn't been raised as an issue through this planning application. The, the education um, have because of, of the new school. Um, but yes, we, we can we can have discussion with with um, education if we think that, that there is an issue. But I, I think broadly speaking, it's it, it's not an issue for education because of the the the, the, the it, it, as a result of house types. But yes, I can I can make sure that the officers talk to each other. Thank you. OK, thank you. Don't see any other hands. I'll move the report. I'll second it, Chair. Thank you. I agree the report. Agreed. Thank you. Then to item nine, that's application P211697, and that's in pages 99 to 120 in Bernard Tickershire item. Thank you, Bernard. Chair, sorry, just before that, oh, sorry. Uh, Councillor Hamilton's declaring an interest. Yes, yeah, sorry, just I'll just that, be... sorry. Sorry, we'll be pretty ill leave Lindsay. Sorry about that. Thanks. Okay, Bernard, that's Councillor Hamilton now left. Okay, thanks, Stuart. Approval of matters specified in condition is sought for the erection of a residential development containing 163 dwellings on an area of land located on Wellhall Road, Hamilton. The site was previously occupied by buildings associated with the former Phillips Signify Company and comprises an area of internal road system, large areas of hard standing grass and shrubs with mature trees located mainly along its north and western boundaries. The site is currently vacant with all buildings within the area having recently been demolished. The site is essentially rectangular in shape and extends to approximately seven hectares. It's bounded by residential development with Wellhall Road located along its northwestern boundary, a roundabout and retail store located at its northern tip. Access to the site is via the existing roundabout in Wellhall Road. The development includes a mix of detached, semi-detached, terraced and flatted dwellings, including an area of affordable housing located in the eastern area of the site. Specifically, the proposed dwellings consist of 123 for private sale and 40 affordable housing units, which the Council's housing services would take ownership of. The buildings within the site would range between two and three storeys, with a three-storey flatted block located at the eastern edge of the site to reflect the existing flats on the adjacent Phillips site, Phillips Wind. The houses located along the southern, bound, 
Southwestern boundary of the site would be two storeys in height, and elsewhere within the development there would be a mix of low and medium density housing. The development would include a mixture of in cartilage parking and parking courts. In terms of the local plan, the site is suitable for residential development and the principle of a housing development at this location is considered to be appropriate. Planning permission in principle was previously granted for residential development on this site and associated works including demolition of buildings and land reprofiling. As part of that, a section 75 obligation was concluded to ensure that appropriate financial contributions were made once the houses are under development. No objections have been raised from consultees subject to the use of appropriate conditions and these comments are summarised in section 4 of the report. With regard to representations, there were two objections and two comment letters submitted relative to the application and the points raised are summarised in section, of the fi section 5 of the report, primarily relating to access, layout and traffic. In general land use terms and policy terms, the principle of residential development at this location is acceptable. The proposed development would allow the construction of further housing, including affordable housing units within Hamilton, which is to be welcomed. The design, layout and scale of the development are acceptable, along with the impact on the surrounding area. The proposed development offers an opportunity to enhance the built environment in the immediate area, and the redevelopment of the site would result in an attractive and vibrant addition to the area. The proposed houses are of modern design with a suitably high standard of external finishing materials and it's considered that the development will be in keeping with the existing residential development in the surrounding areas. The proposed access arrangements have been assessed and subject to conditions are considered to be acceptable by the Council's road service. The proposal would relate satisfactorily to adjacent and residential development in terms of scale, design and materials and the character and amenity of the area would not be impaired by reason of traffic generation, parking or visual intrusion. The proposal represents a sensitive reuse of a previously developed and currently vacant site and it's considered that the redevelopment of the site would improve the visual and environmental quality of the area. Overall, it is considered that the application complies with the relevant local plan policies and it's therefore recommended that the application is granted subject to conditions. Thank you, Bernard. Bert? Thanks, Cheryl. Just a, a common sort of a theme here. Uh, are you quite satisfied that all the infrastructure is or will be in place? Is there play areas there and has uh, the thoughts and observations of uh, people already living there, have they all been taken into account? Thank you. Um, the, the answer to all of those things are, are yes. From a planning perspective, we've looked at education, community facilities, affordable housing, and uh, and roads and access. So um, there will be a contribution required for education and for community facilities. There's also been an amendment to uh, the application during the processing to invite it to include a small play area within the development. It's relatively close by to some of the local amenities and there will be some further um, works required to ensure that traffic generation either from this site or existing doesn't create any issues in the surrounding area. So from a planning point of view, we are satisfied. Th thanks for that answer, Chair. Could you just ask Bernard, uh, when you're doing the, the, the play area, could be consultation, would it be possible to put a piece of equipment with children with a disability? This is things that uh, a subject comes up all the time. If you could consider that, please. Thank you. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Graham? Thank you, Chair. Just a minor point. Bert covered some of the broader points I wanted to make, but just a minor point. I'm led to believe the, the applicant has have had their advertising billboards up around this site for the last several weeks. And I know they've been told recently to bring them down. It's just a word to the wise for not just this developer, but other developers that you don't put your advertising billboards up until you've actually got consent. It doesn't look good and it gives it just gives a, pers a bad perception. Uh, if, if they want to jump the gun, fine, but hopefully we can tell them if they are jumping the gun. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Bernard. Thanks, Graham. Lynn? Thanks, Chair. Um, I am very familiar with this um, area and also very familiar with the um, congestion, the traffic congestion that arises there at peak times, um, it is horrendous. Um, and I cannot imagine how a development of this size 
Um, I'm not against the development. I just cannot see how the number of vehicles, additional vehicles that this will generate um, will possibly m not impact on the congestion that already exists at peak times. I would like to see um, if information could be circulated, please, um, traffic management um, information that roads are proposing and um, traffic control systems, because I cannot imagine what they can do there to ease congestion with an additional several hundred vehicles that are going to be generated. Thanks, Len. Do you want to come back in on that, Bernard? Um, I think that's probably one that Fraser would be able to come in on and, and comment, if that's okay, Fraser. Yeah, um, thank you. And through your chair, um, yeah, there's a number of uh, measures that are proposed, um, some of which um, form part of the city deal funding through the Hamilton Community Growth Area, actually, as well. Um, so the improvements to the Woodfoot Road Hill House uh, would, um, would the kind of double roundabouts there to be improved, increased capacity. Um, there's also uh, the scoot timings within the kind of uh, circulatory system within the town centres to be reviewed. Um, and I mean, I, I, the congestion won't go away, uh, Councillor, unfortunately. Um, but what we've tried to do is mitigate the impact of this development by doing these. And one of the uh, relatively minor measures is to put down, uh, keep clear marking just to keep um, Wellhall Road and Hilton Bank Street uh, free so that traffic can come in and out of there, just acknowledging the existing um, uh, traffic issues. Um, but I mean, we're hopeful as well that um, what we're seeing at the moment um, is that the, the peak traffic flows, um, the, the peaks are a lot lower than they have been. Um, I'm not saying congestion hasn't occurred just now, but just to put it into sort of context uh, with the pandemic, that the, the peak traffic flows um, are lower than they used to be. Um, but what's happening is there's more traffic through the day. So whilst the peaks are lower, um, it, yeah, that, will, that will help peak times. Um, so um, we're kind of satisfied that the measures that are put in place will mitigate the impact of this development as best they can. If I can just come back in, Chair, if that's OK. Yeah, that's OK. I, ha I have to say thank you very much for the information that you just provided me with. But improving the roundabout, round, roundabout capacity at Woodfoot Road, um, tweaking the scoot system through Hamilton, um, and put in keep clear markings in at Hilton Bank Street and the and, and perhaps Lilybank Street as well. I, I'm, I've got to say I'm not terribly reassured. Do you want to come back in, Fraser? Um, I mean I think it's, it's fair to say that there will be um, still some congestion, so it, it won't uh, it won't unfortunately go away. Um, we think as well that. Um, if queues are uh, longer, which uh, I don't expect them to be significantly longer, that people will um, be direct. Um, for example, people that would possibly have gone to East Kilbride via the back road would start to use Burnbank Road and go up East Kilbride Road. Um, and well, certainly that was something uh, that did myself. Um, but in terms of the, the TA, so that was um, approved through the, the PPP application. Uh, so a year ago um, or so. Um, we're, all, we're also kind of hoping as well, obviously, that the introduction of cycle measures uh, through the site um, and um, new bus stop shelters and a new controlled crossing point um, will help to encourage people to use uh, sustainable means and reduce uh, the need to use the car. Thanks, Fraser. Mary? Uh, yeah, the other point that I was going to look at with while the building's going on, uh, can we get the building management strategies in place where the, the lorries are getting their fields cleaned and that kind of thing so that that's not coming out onto the main road uh, and actually causing much more of a problem. Um, and I also concur with a lot of the points that Lynn had made. It's already been expressed within the community groups that people are concerned about the congestion that is going to happen there. Although I do support going forward, there's just uh, the 40 uh, council houses that are going to be built in that area. Uh, I would like to see a welcome that. Thanks, Fraser. Um, 
But I think there is still a bit of tweaking, Jack. For Fraser. Okay, thank you. No, no, do you want to come back in? Yes. Are you okay? Yes, cheers. Um, it was just to confirm there is a condition that will be attached and it's just about uh, for the developer to submit a construction management plan for a for approval. So that will cover the points that um, Councillor Donnelly was raising. Thanks, Bernard. I'll move the report. I'll second it, Chair. Thank you. Agree the report? Agreed. Okay, thank you. We'll just give Lindsay a minute or two to come back in then. Hi, Councillor Hamilton, can I just confirm that you've rejoined? I'm back. Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item 10 is application P211444. And that's on pages 121 to 130. And Tina will take us through the item. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. This is a detailed planning application by the Scotsman Group for a site um, which was the former Stuart Hotel site, which is, is vacant um, at Cornwall Way in, in East Kilbride. Um, just to make members aware, we did receive two letters, um, two emails from the architects um, following the publication of the papers, really just um, adding to their um, case. Um, I, I don't propose to go into them in any, in any detail because it was after the public the papers were published. Um, but just to say they're both largely supportive of the content of the report um, and emphasising that it would be a reuse of a vacant derelict site. The other point in the make in their second email really is not a planning issue as it relates to the licensing. Um, however, they have asked just to make uh, members aware um, that they have uh, the current legal agreement with the shopping centre. Um, the licence that they have in the shopping centre is due to expire shortly for their existing licence unit. And their intention is for the, the, the group to transfer the licence to the new retail unit um, should it get planning permission. Um, but as I say, that's that's separate to the, the planning considerations. Turning back to the report, the applicants seek detailed consent for the erection of a retail unit um, on the site. It's proposed that the retail unit would be utilised as a licensed convenience store. The proposed building would be single storey in height um, and the development would utilise approximately 40% of the site and an area of uh, temporary landscaping would be put in place along Cornwall Way to screen the remainder of the site, um, which would not be developed as part of the, the current proposals. The site is designated as forming part of the East Kilbride Town Centre um, and the, the policy status is set out in Section 3 of the report. Um, but the, given that it is zoned for commercial use, the principle of retail development in planning terms is, is acceptable. Turning to consultations, um, we have um, the consultation set out in section four of the report. Um, roads are now satisfied given the, the, the layout and the, the um, access route into the servicing is acceptable and have no objections to the proposal um, and environmental services have no objections. In terms of representations, we've received eight letters of representation, seven objection letters and one letter of comment. And the points are set out in section five of the report. It, probably the main issue is, is the, the, the objectors are highlighting the empty units in the area, in the town centre. Um, and this is a proposal for um, another retail unit. However, um, as members will be aware, the planning service is required to consider this proposal on its own merits um, for this site. It is a derelict empty site um, and irrespective of the empty units within the, 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 the town centre, we have to consider this application on its merits. It is a retail proposal on a, a site zone for this type of use. Um, so, as I say, it is acceptable in, in principle. Turning to our assessment and conclusions, um, in its favour, the proposed development would 
bring part of a vacant site back into commercial use with landscaping also provided um, to enhance the site and screen the remaining part of the, the site, which um, there's no proposals for at, at the moment. It's therefore recommended that the planning, that planning consent is granted for the proposed uh, development subject to the attached conditions. Thank you, Tina. Jim? Yeah, the only thing I can say about this application, you know, I don't think we could refuse it, but it's a sad state of affairs when the sixth largest town in Scotland, we have a prime site in the town centre and we're reduced to an application for a single story licence, off licence if you like, to replace an existing off licence which then become empty. I, I just, I don't know where we go from here. The town centre is dying. This is just a, another symptom of how how quickly and how, how bad the situation is deteriorating. OK, thanks, Jim. Archie? Uh, hi, Chair. The Jim makes some relevant points there, but uh, this area is an absolute eyesore with antisocial behaviour and vandalism taking place quite regularly. Anything going to that prominent location in the town, it would be an improvement in the area. So I'll certainly be supporting it. Thank you. Thanks, Archie. Graham? Thank you, Chair. I'll, st I'll start with Archie's point, which is quite right. Anything, whatever this develops into is an improvement on what we have currently. But the point I want to make is, and, and maybe get a clarification from Pauline and maybe even Monica, is obviously it says here it's a retail unit class one and it's it's down on the papers that there's going to be a convenience store. Obviously, the Stuart Hotel is a, a big site. Even 40% of it being used as a convenience store is going to be a large convenience store. Uh, under retail unit class one, does that does what fall under category B uh, a metro supermarket? Could this ostensibly end up as a metro supermarket in terms of uh, they've got forty percent they could come in and uh, or somebody else shows interest in it and they add an amended application to get the forty percent raise because it's a big site and I just want to know if. Retail unit class one, I mean, I know the application's for a convenience store. Would a metro supermarket fall under class one as well? Pauline, do you want to come and answer that one? I'm embarrassingly trying to remember all the use class orders here, Chairman. I think... Um, my apologies, <laughs> Pauline. Greatest apologies. My, I didn't mean to... <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, it's every application on its merit. I think are you saying could they come and extend and increase the size of the of the store? They could, but that would be a separate application. Um, at the moment, it's a convenience store, so it's prime. It's a it's a food store. I don't know if Tina can offer any assistance. Sure. No, uh, uh, through your chair, no, just to reflect what Pauline said, um, it's class one, so yes, a food store, but if it was to be a different a different floor space um, or a, a, an extension, then we would have to take that into consideration. Um, but given it's a town centre location, um, given the scale of it, um, it, it would probably be acceptable, but we would have to look at any uh, further proposals separately. Okay, so theoretically, a supplementary chair. So theoretically, um, the application that we passed today for a convenience store, it could be a well-known uh, high street name that could be above the shingle um, on that store. If it's, if they could use it as they could change it from a convenience store to a metro supermarket or a metro link store. Theoretically. Sorry, I was on mute. Through you, Chair, thank you. Only if, if they put in an, a separate planning application, Councillor Scott. Um, 
And and indeed, even at the size it is, it could be a high street name because, as you know, a number of, of the supermarkets do have smaller convenience type offers, you know. Um, but I, I don't know if we know the end user. Perhaps Tina can show some light on that. I don't think we do, but I'm not aware. Uh, through you, Chair. Uh, no, I don't. I, I mean, the Scotsman Group um, do operate their own units um, elsewhere, I think. So, um, I, but uh, I, I don't know um, what name would be above the door. Okay, thank you. John Anderson? Yeah, I'll let the digital parade news. I'll be well ago. It's going to be 101. We already have a place uh, along from the site that's uh, been discussed today. So as far as I know, it's 101 that is going to be opening this up. So I don't know if Pauline or Tina are aware of that, but certainly it was in the, the Scoop Ride News uh, that they were putting in a planning application for it. Thanks. I wasn't aware through YouTube, but that's good. Thanks for that, Councillor Anderson. I need to read the Scoop Ride News, obviously. <laughs> Okay, thanks everyone. I'll move the report. No second it, Chair. Thank you. Agree with the report? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Agenda item 11, that's application P210604, and that's on pages 131 to 136, and oh, sorry, 139, sorry, 138, get it right, and Bernard will take us that item. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you, Chair. Planning permission is sought for the erection of. Oh, of one off-grid holiday cabin within the land managed by Claycorn Farm Trust. The proposed cabin would be located in a natural clearing in close proximity to a path and stone wall. The site is relatively isolated within the 250-acre Claycorn estate. A supporting document in the form of a business plan was submitted with the application, explaining the background to the application, which stated that the application is necessary to ensure the longevity and future of Claycorn estate and farm. Further, it will provide additional, much needed tourist accommodation located close to the new Lanark World Heritage Site and other nearby tourism related destinations. The cabin itself would be made of sustainably sourced, slow grown spruce and would be treated in natural looking stain. It would be under 20 square metres in size and would have two separate areas, one for sleeping and the other for living dining. The roof and floor will be insulated and have a solar powered light, while heating and cooking will be provided via a wood burning stove using locally sourced seasoned wood. In line with a sustainable approach, water will be sourced from an existing private supply and will be, will be brought in as will firewood. In terms of the local plan, development of the site for tourist related accommodation, which also contributes to farm diversification, is acceptable. The consultation responses are summarised in section of the report, four of the report and no objections have been raised. One representation was received which sought to minimise any impact of the development on trees and it should be noted that there are no trees affected by the proposal. It's considered that in terms of scale, design and siting, the application site is capable of accommodating the proposed holiday cabin without having any detrimental impact on the visual or rural amenity of the surrounding area. The property is located some distance from the local road network and would not be highly visible from the surrounding area. The use and scale of the proposed cabin is considered acceptable at this location. The proposal will provide a form of tourism related accommodation representing an appropriate form of rural, rural diversification and it is therefore recommended that the application is granted subject to conditions. Thank you Bernard. David? Thank you, Chair. Um, I would welcome this development and encourage the department to encourage developments in the tourism trade for Clydesdale as it is our second largest industry after agriculture. So these are very welcome and I hope this is a sign of things to come in the future. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Thank you, David. So say I'll move the report. I'll second that. Thank you. Agree the report? Agreed. Thank you. Agenda <coughs> item 12 is South Lanarkshire Local Development Plan 2, Supporting Planning Guidance, Community Infrastructure Assessment, and that's on pages 139 to 168. And Tony will take us through that. Thank you, Tony. Yeah, thank you, Chair. 
So the, the purpose of this report is to inform the committee of the work that's being carried out to prepare support and planning guidance on community infrastructure assessment, and then to seek committee approval for the proposed SPG that's set out in the appendix, and then after the carrying out of a six-week period of public consultation. Section four of the report, it sets out the legislative and policy context of the report. Um, community infrastructure assessment is a process where the council can seek financial contributions from developers, where proposals require capital or other works to enable the development to proceed by mitigating the impact on essential infrastructure. And by that we mean roads, education, halls, etc. Developer contributions are not like other funds, which are available to local communities to bid for. Um, they do have to be sought in line with government policy and must directly relate to the impact the development would have on an area. It's also not appropriate for developers to be asked to pay to address existing shortfalls in the provision of facilities or services, nor address defects such as uh, repairs to existing buildings, which are not linked to the development. So policy seven in the adopted local development plan two sets the high level policy context for this issue. And it's this policy the SPG seeks to support. The legislative basis for seeking contributions is found in section 75 of the, the Act. And this allows the council to enter into a planning obligation with developers to restrict or regulate development or use of land, including a requirement to make payments where appropriate. So more detailed guidance on this is set out in the government circular on planning obligations. It particularly highlights that planning obligations allow the grant of planning permission by reducing, eliminating or compensating for potentially negative impacts um, resulting from the development. And then the circular also sets out the five tests that planning obligations must meet to be lawful and they're set out in the report as well. It also goes on to say that um, consideration should be given to the economic viability of proposals when deciding the form and scale of contributions um, as an obligation might have a financial impact for developers and make proposals uneconomic. So in this respect, Council asks for the developer to undertake um, a financial viability assessment for the development, taking account of the level of contributions being asked for. And this allows a reasonable and proportionate approach to the level of contributions expected and also the timing of the works being carried out on the making of payments. Um, the aim is to strike a balance between setting contribution levels so that they address any direct impact of the development, but also ensuring the proposal remains viable. So when we've um, we've come to review the existing guidance, uh, supplementary guidance, and um, a number of changes have been proposed, and these are set out in a bit more detail in the report. The first one relates to um, the threshold we use for seeking contributions in the first place. At the moment, we, we ask for them from housing developments comprising 20 units or more. So we've reviewed this figure um, in recognition that smaller developments can have an impact on existing infrastructure and service provision, especially cumulatively. We looked at um, the approach of other planning authorities and we found that South Lancashire Council is the only one with a figure as high as 20 units across all the categories. In contrast, several predominantly rural authorities seek contributions for single house developments, but the most common threshold is set at four units or more. Overall, we we're proposing that we reduce the figure to five units, um, as this would reflect more accurately the effect new development has on services, as I said, in particular in terms of the, the cumulative impact of a number of small developments. Um, a threshold of less than five units, we think, would result in um, considerable administrative burden while resulting in low value contributions that would not bring a great deal of significant community benefit to the area. So therefore, the, the figure of five units is the one we're, we're recommending. A secondary impact issue in this respect is the impact on um, small and medium enterprises and um, small house builders or local businesses. And from an economic development viewpoint, there's a desire to help small businesses retain safeguard jobs, especially as we emerge from the pandemic. So for that reason, it's not been proposed to take contributions in the categories for less than five units. The one exception, though, is, is in relation to when we take contributions for affordable housing from, from private developers. The high level policy 12 in the LDP2 states that affordable housing provision will only be sought for developments of 20 units or more. So this sets the context on this issue. And under current national legislation, that figure can't be changed uh, without reviewing the entire local development plan. 
So we're therefore proposing that the 20 unit threshold will remain in terms of affordable housing contributions. As I said earlier, though, we are going to be start reviewing and preparing a replacement LDP later this year. And we'll, we'll, we'll reflect on this as, as we do that. A couple of smaller changes. Um, education resources are seeking some small changes to the way in which they calculate the level of contributions. And these are described fully in the report. We're also proposing that um, explicit references made in terms of the contributions roads and transportation can, can receive to allow contributions to be sought um, that would create and enhance active travel opportunities. Now, this reflects emerging national planning policy that sees 20 million neighbourhoods as a means of achieving compact and connected neighbourhoods to ensure people meet the majority of their daily needs within a reasonable walk, wheel or cycle. And so new housing developments will be required to encourage people to live more locally and also to contribute to the creation of sustainable travel options and safe living environments. In this context, we will point developers to the um, active travel studies that roads uh, have already um, developed and have been approved and also to the, the, the cycle strategy that is in preparation at the moment. The final change relates to how we, um, first of all, identify the need for contributions to address the impact of new development on existing community assets, such as libraries and community halls. And if um, if a need is established, how we calculate um, the, the sum that's required. Um, so that, that's all set out in, in the report as well. Um, so we're recommending that the proposed SPG that's set out in the appendix is approved. If members are agreed with that, it's intent, intended to finalise the document. And then we're going to publish it and make it available for public comment during probably March, April uh, for a six week period. After that public consultation exercise, we, we produce another report summarising the comments received, the council response and any suggested revisions to the SPG, and that will be considered a future meeting of the planning committee. So that's the recommendation, Chair, and I'll hand back to you. Thank you, Tony. Jim? Yeah, this report is actually long overdue. Uh, I've got some reservations about it, however. We, we have operated this basis of 20 units, which was really quite an arbitrary number. It didn't, didn't have any scientific basis to it. And we're now moving to a, a position where we're choosing an arbitrary number between 1 and 10. You know, and, and it's the cumulative effect of, of developments is, is, is important. You know, a thousand single units is, has the same effect as 10, uni, 10 units of 100 you know, on the, the infrastructure and everything else. So, you know, my instinct is, you know, a non arbitrary number, namely we go to one unit, end of story. The other reservation I have about it, you know, we talk about, you know, uh, effect on your know, recreational space, communities, etc. And I think we've got to be a, a wee bit more ambitious and take a bit wider context into this. You know, if I take for example East Kilbride, right, I'm not going to be parochial, but it's an example of, 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 of the kind of thing I'm talking about. Right, in East Kilbride, we've got two major attractions the Heritage Park and Calder Glen Country Park, which serve the whole of East Kilbride. Right? They may be in a particular ward, but they serve the whole of East Kilbride. Now, I would regard those as being areas that we should be seeking to develop. And the bigger East Kilbride gets, the more people that live in East Kilbride, the more important they become. And I don't think we make enough use of developing developer contributions you know, to, to, to spend on e these kind of attractions or, or recreational areas. I mean, I know now we've got some money after a long, long time of asking for it. We've got some money from the, the growth area to go to the, the country park and Green Hills Library on the kind of basis I'm talking about, that they are all whole East Kilbride assets and they have to be taken into account. We don't just look at a street and a housing development and say, oh, we need a play area in that, that particular spot. We may not need it. 
Well, what we do need is we need the central major attractions or major areas of recreation to be taken into account. And I think developer contributions can make a, a significant contribution in that respect. And I, I would like to see that done, but certainly reduce the developer contribution or make developer contributions for a single unit as you know the the, the, the basis for the developer contributions. Thank you, Jim. Paul, you want to come in? Thank, thanks, Chair. Just, just to assist Tony, I mean, I know members have been keen for us to do work on contributions um, and there has been a lot of work and research and time spent on up, updating the, the SPG before you today. You'll recall that we had the member session um, back in April and a number of you had attended and we took the views of, of members on board about things like the thresholds at that. We've also been consulting with our spending departments you know, housing, education, roads and so on, because obviously, although the money comes in through the planning system, it's the other departments that spend the money. So their view is important. The other thing is um, the, the um, opting for five units is not really arbitrary, Councillor Water, or only in as much as no two planning authorities, the length and breadth of Scotland, have the same thresholds. We did ascertain, or, or Tony did in his extensive research, that at 20 units, South Lanarkshire was one of the highest in Scotland, but there's no one size in any authority. And, and picking the five, there was two things. There was kind of a balance between the very disparate nature of South Lanarkshire, um, which has very urban and also very rural areas, um, with my kind of economic development hat on, if you like, and the need to kind of look at small businesses and small builders who will be building, you know, developments of five houses or less. Um, by and large, your big housing developers like Barrett, Wimpy, Persimmon, they quite I wouldn't say happily pay contributions, but they, they're ready to pay the contributions. They can afford it. They've built it into their cash flow. The smaller builders, the kind of businesses, economic development have been helping out in the last two years through the emergency business grants to try and keep people in jobs. And it's local jobs, you know, local indigenous businesses. They would potentially suffer if we started putting that burden on them. Um, and the, in addition to that, there is the additional admin um, issues around economy contributions and, and setting up section 75 for one house or more because every single um section 75 needs a separate legal agreement so it's a big burden on the planning department it's a big burden on the legal department negotiating these um, and we don't think that would necessarily bring in a lot of extra money in other words administrative burden um would be greater than the amount of money we'd bring bring in. Um, whereas going down to five units, we think it's fair. We think it makes sense alongside what other similar authorities do. And we have done some benchmarking um, and you know, we think it will regularise the situation um, in some regard. Um, just picking up Councillor Warthol's comments about taking into account big big parks, big community facilities that have more of an impact um, on an area rather than just local facilities. Um, I mean, as, as you said, Councillor Wartob, in, in the East Kobe Community Growth Area, Section 75, we did take a contribution to the country park um, on the basis that there's only one country park for East Kilbride and it serves the whole of East Kilbride. So that is something that we do do and we will be doing going forward. But as always, it's a balance between the big facilities that more people use, but also small local facilities um, that serve the local community and all within the, the, the tight constraints of the legal framework. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Pauline. Graham? Thank you, Chair. I say, uh, like, like Councillor Wardhall, I am certainly generally supportive of this and it's a huge step forward from where we were. I mean, 20, it was obvious that 20 was an outlier in Scotland, and having it down at five uh, is basically in line with uh, with other authorities. I mean, that's the end of 19 as a magic number. I notice you, I think it was 15, develop, 15 developments over the last three years. There'll be an extra 15, roughly five a year, that will now um, applicants and who will qualify for benefits in terms of community infrastructure that will no longer, uh, that they'll now be qualified when 
they wouldn't have been under the 20. Another point is on education. And I noticed, and I'll use an example, I wonder if Councillor Brogan is still on the, on the call, was uh, there was a, a large amount of money for community benefit given in the, the campus land community growth area, the one out Newton and beyond. And I think it was a fairly large size of money, but by the time education took their pound of flesh off it, sizable amount of money, there wasn't an awful lot left for the general community because the schools in that area weren't necessarily in that ward. I mean, is there a cap on what education can take in terms of uh, their slice of any uh, community assets money given by developers? Again, fully supportive of, I think it's a move in the right direction from 20 down to five. You'll always get four as a magic number now, but uh, many thanks to Tony and his team and yourself, Pauline, that I think this is a huge step forward and uh, an awful lot amount of good research went into it uh, to not just pluck a figure of five, but to get one that's generally in line with other authorities that fit our demographics. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Graham. Pauline, do you want to come back in? Um, I mean, I, I can't really speak for my education um, colleagues, and you know, Tony might need to help me. And they want to change the the formula of how they calculate contribution contributions more around the the denominational non denominational split because they've had a blanket percentage across South Lanarkshire, and they found out that it varies. So they want to take a more local approach. I think the issue for for Cambus Lang and Newton Councillor Scott, um, and we've debated it many, many times, not least with. With Councillor Brogan, both in, in committee and outside it, is that the, the education then allocate the funding to the catchment area schools, whether they're, they're, they're secondary or, or primary or, or denominational or non-denominational and the catchment schools for Cambus Lang are not in Cambus Lang, not in the ward, they're actually with the ward, I think um, the kids go to, to Addingston and some of the other schools. I mean, that that is clearly an issue, and I know that there is a, a desire to have a, sec, a secondary school provision in Cambus Lang, but that is actually something out with the remit of planning. That's something that would be the council or as developer and education authority to look at. But there are decent amounts of contributions brought in through the system for Cambus Lang. They then just go to the cast catchment schools. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Pauline. I don't see any other hands, so I'll move the report. No second, it, Chair. Thank you. Agree the report? Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Well, thank you all very much for your attendance today. and It's been a very worthwhile meeting. So I'd like to thank you again, and I'll ask you to stop the recording. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Good.